For any of you out there that remember, a few years ago I did a review series on the Dead of Night collection, which had its fair share of good films and its fair share of absolutely terrible ones. Well, after finishing that, I decided to complete another collection from my childhood, that being the Vipco Scream Time collection. And after a few years of buying, a few years of moving house for the hundredth time, finally got the complete collection. And I'm going to take a look at it. Otherwise, it'd feel like a complete waste of money. So, a little background information. Vipco, which stands for Video Instant Picture Company, <laughs> rolls right off the tongue were a release company in the UK running from the late 70s to 2007. They're famously known for putting out video nasties on VHS during the pre-certification era of home video and being caught up in the video nasty controversy of the 80s. During the early 2000s they began re-releasing some of their back catalogue onto DVD in various collections. This includes the Vault of Horror collection and this one right here that I've collected, the Scream Time collection. This is all 45 films on the Scream Time release. A few have also been released on the Vault of Horror set too. You can also see that this is the release that the Dead of Night ripped off completely. Now, Vipco is a relatively well-known and loved company, and so there's extensive information about them online. There's even a documentary that's called Vipco The Untold Story, and a book called Video Nasty Mayhem. Both were released over the past few years, and I've not checked them out, so I don't know if they're worth your time or not. But it all goes to show that researching Vipco compared to The Dead of Night was an absolute breeze because there's so much information and there's catalogues of all the releases out there online. So if you're interested in collecting yourself, information is easy to find on Vipco. That being said, even though it's a well-known, well-liked and well-documented company, it's not perfect. And I'm planning to go through the entire Scream Time collection and see which ones are worth your time and which ones aren't. And a lot of these films you may have heard of recently because Arrow and 88 Films have been re-releasing them. So join me as I take a look at a series of films that people have heard of, but ultimately nobody cares about. And next week we'll be taking a look at Asylum. So, I've checked out Asylum, and it's not too bad. I'll start with a bit of background information. So, Asylum uh, is also known as House of Crazies, and it's a 1972 British horror film directed by Roy Ward Baker and written by Robert Bloch. Uh, Bloch wrote some of the short stories that this film's based on as well. And he also wrote, funnily enough, the novelisation of Hitchcock's Psycho. Now, there are four short stories that this film's based on written by Bloch, and it plays out as an anthology film with the main plot being about a guy turning up at a mental hospital for a job interview and the head of the hospital says that one of the doctors has uh, gone crazy and he's now one of the patients and he tasks this guy with figuring out which of the patients is the now ex-doctor and if he gets it right he gets the job. So then we have uh, four patient stories with the last patient story tying into the main plot. It's got a great cheap feel and it's very 70s uh, it's quite slow paced and it sort of absorbs you into the environments and the atmosphere and then when it's lulled you in, then it gets really weird. I must say though, even though the film does start out quite strong, with the first patient story in particular being quite entertaining, it does unfortunately get worse and worse as it goes along. Luckily though, they do save one of the best for last, and the film ends with a whole bunch of crazy and ridiculous plot twists and effects. The second story is of note as well because it stars Peter Cushing, and they really used him in the promotional material. Honestly though, he's not too bad, it's just a shame he's acting alongside a guy with a terrible Italian accent. No, 
What can I do for you, Mr. Rep? Must be no mistake. Is that clear? No mistake. Everything will be as you wish, I swear. As enjoyable as it is, I must admit it's quite tame. A lot of the deaths happen off screen and a lot of the violence is quite toned down and minimal. For the first film in this release, I was expecting a little more. Luckily though, where it is lacking in gore, it does make up for with ridiculously over the top and bizarre scenes. So you probably noticed, the picture quality on this release isn't great, it's very soft looking. Now it is kind of a good aesthetic for this sort of film, but it's clearly just a cheap VHS strip or some terrible 16mm print. Also the sound isn't great and sometimes the dialogue can be quite difficult to make out. If only I could see you first. You'll see me soon enough. Pretend. I needed it because of my son. Let's take a look at the packaging. The case was pretty good, although digitally remastered is a stretch, and I spotted this grammatical error on the back. They really go overboard with this whole description, making the asylum out to be this terribly heinous place, but in reality, we barely see much of the actual asylum, and I would not give this film an 18 certificate. It's a 12A at best. They also refer to the DVD as a video cassette, which I find quite amusing. Maybe they copied this line off the VHS releases. And let's see what we get on the disc. Not much really. Stills, chapter select, filmographies. Pretty standard stuff really for early budget DVD releases. And we also get a trailer. Now, I was expecting this trailer to be for this film. But it's not. It's for a rom-com called Tim, starring Mel Gibson and Catherine from Twin Peaks. Colleen McCulloch's Tim. You don't read anything. Huh? Ah. You can't read. Tim is a tender, heartwarming story of two people who never meant to fall in. I'm sure someone who buys Vipco films is also in the market for this, right? It's really got me wondering what other trailers we're going to come across in this collection. And a young man who had never loved like this before. So, to sum up, if you're into older horror films, this one's not too bad. Now this is not going to scratch any gore hounds itches, but if you like a slower, more atmospheric horror with a bunch of ridiculous moments, then this one might be for you. Now, as for the release itself, it's kind of what I expected really. It's nothing special, subpar quality, but it doesn't hinder the film too much. Now, if the release has put you off, then there is a Blu-ray out there by Second Sight, and it looks like there's a bunch of special features with that. Not just a trailer for bloody Tim. So, so far, not a bad start. But I think it's only going to get better from there. Because next week we're going to be taking a look at... Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. Alright. So, I checked out The Beyond. And it turns out... I'd seen it before. It was one of those, I'm sure you've had it before, where you're looking at a film and you're thinking, I swear I've seen this before. And then a few minutes in you realise, yeah, you have actually seen it before. Not a problem though. It's a brilliant film. Really good. Probably one of my favourite Fulci films of the films of his that I've actually seen. Uh, so Lucio Fulci, probably best known for directing uh, Zombie Flesh Eaters, which we did cover in the Dead of Night collection, uh, a series that I did 
it's a really good film and we are going to be covering its sequels in this review series later on down the line so this has got exactly what you want from a Fulci film now masterfully made gore uh, I'll show you bits where I can um, warning if you're squeamish if you are squeamish though I'm not really sure why you're watching this video This is an excellent example of an 80s Italian horror film, and this one kicked off the 80s, being made in 1981. So the story is about a hotel that houses one of the seven gates of hell, and in the past a painter accidentally opens this gate, and he gets killed for it. And then, in present day 80s, a woman called Liza inherits the hotel and she's trying to renovate it when she accidentally reopens the gate. The story is told really well through gothic style sets, slow and atmospheric horror, and a whole lot of terrible acting. Just what you need, really. Big surprise, huh? More or less. I mean, I, I knew I had a rich uncle who was a bachelor with a lot of real estate, but I never imagined from one day to the next that I'd be <laughs> running the hotel. Harris here. Miller wants you up in 24 on the double. I'm on my way, honey. Here. And he tried to kill you, huh? Please, John. You... you must believe me. What are you doing in my room? I was looking for keys. The best part of this film, however, is the side characters. We've got loads of them, and they're all crazy and extremely watchable. If it's not Joe the Plumber, it'll be the old dude in the bookshop who'll tickle you and leave you wanting a film solely dedicated to them. Having on Hi, Larry. How's it going? Oh, good morning. I'm going to have this whole wall finished by tonight. Great. Bye. Hey, is anybody home? Yes, sir. I made this little pathway to the far end just for Joe. <laughs> So there are two scenes that I want to talk about briefly because I feel that they're worth talking about. Uh, spoilers, I guess. So the first scene involves a mother and daughter visiting a hospital where they get into a bit of a jam. The mother's face gets melted off by this like milk looking substance and she turns into a red smoothie along the floor. And the daughter gets a face full of zombie and goes blind. Now the second scene involves a man who falls off a ladder and then out of nowhere, he's getting eaten by tarantulas for four minutes. Incredible. Ah! So you probably noticed again that the prim isn't amazing. It is a bit better than last week, and it doesn't ruin the film in any way at all. Luckily, the sound is really good this week, and that's good because the soundtrack by Fabio Frieza is excellent. Let's have a look at the packaging. It's really good. A fine example of a Vipco film. Really bigs up the film on the back, and it does not disappoint. Runtime's spot on, there's no spelling errors. It's all good here. There's even a quote from Time Out. You wouldn't see that on a Dead of Night film. Little side note as well, the first DVD started with the old Vipco logo. This one starts with a different and much worse logo. Then a little montage and then the menu pops up. It's not as good as the first release, Asylum. But also, see any similarities here? That must just be a coincidence. And let's see what we get on the disc. A really cheap looking menu, and then just standard stuff. Stills, filmographies, 
chapter select, and trailers, plural. Now, what trailers are we going to get this week? Good ones. And we start off with a trailer for Psychic Killer, which is a film we're going to be covering on episode 39 of this series, and it makes it look pretty good. And we also get a trailer for Shogun Assassin, which Vipco released on their Vault of Horror collection. For those who don't know, this is a butchered version of uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. And if you haven't seen Lone Wolf and Cub, they are definitely worth checking out. And this Criterion box set is amazing. So, not too bad with the trailers this week. One man and one child defy the most notorious masters of death on the planet. So, to sum up, this is a must watch for fans of horror, gore or falsha. It's fun, it's silly, it's violent and it is a great addition to this collection. It's also sporting an amazing soundtrack by Freeze. There are other versions of this out there, there's a Blu-ray by Shameless and there's a Blu-ray by Arrow floating around so if you prefer a copy with better quality then I'd go for one of those. Probably the Arrow version is they're generally really good. So. Decent film this week, and next week we've got the longest film in the entire collection. The Blade in the Dark. Alright, so, what is A Blade in the Dark? Well, if you remember from the last episode, I said that it has the longest running time of all of the Vipco Scream Time films. And it really feels like it, but more on that later. So it's a 1983 Italian giallo film directed by Lamberto Bava, who is the son of Mario Bava. And he's best known for directing Demons, which was produced by Dario Argento. Uh, so the plot's pretty straightforward. It's about a musician who's working on the score to a horror film and women keep dying around him, and he suspects that it has something to do with the film he's working on. There's gore, there's suspense, and there's a hell of a lot of waiting around. Female, you are a female, you are a female, you are a female, you are a female. This is all the whiskey you possess? The bottle is finished. <gasps> so this film is a real mixed bag. I'll start off by saying some of the things that I liked about it though. Uh, the music's great. Uh, some of the kills are quite interesting. I quite like the one where the director gets strangled by her own film. Uh, some of the shots are quite nice. And the ending twist is a lot of fun. The best part, however, is the dubbing. It's hilarious. Some lines are translated and acted terribly. Is it possible you're such a vacant nerd? Your satisfaction is to sit like a frog in the sun? Yes, Bruno. She was killed while you were playing the piano, all right? You know, Julia, you are being slightly difficult. 6.30, I'll be waiting then. Ciao. There, you see. All's well that finishes well, or whatever the guy said. If there was any whiskey left, this would be a good time to drink it. Right. Save the tea and yogurt for breakfast. <laughs> I thought of you, too. And now for the bad. The characters are really unlikable, and they bicker a lot, which really gets tiring. Also, the gore, it's not that well done. Some of the kills are interesting, but some of them are just pathetic. The pacing is the main issue, however. There are so many scenes that are really trying to build up the suspense, and it just equates to a bunch of people slowly walking around an empty house. And the environments are bland as well, so you can't even look at any nice sets.
The release is pretty good this week though. Picture quality is great and the sound's alright as well. Did keep getting a weird crackling sound however. Put a few clips up on here, see if you can hear it as well. To compose a score like this, am I the right one? Bruno, you were the only choice for this. How come the diary's still on the table? So let's see what we get with the case. All seems pretty good, everything's correct, it sells the film quite well, and we even get this warning for a bathroom scene. In all honesty, the bathroom scene's pretty tame to today's standards, but it's always interesting seeing what was once seen as controversial. Another thing I've noted is the logo. Again, it's different, and we haven't had the same logo twice yet. This one does look better than the previous one, but it's for the wrong series. Now that is a dead of night level mistake if I've ever seen one. And let's see what we get on the disc. Same as usual again. Chapter select, stills, galleries. And this week we get four trailers. The spoilers. We get the same two trailers as last week. And this week we also get a trailer for Mountain of the Cannibal Gods, which we'll be covering on episode 12 of this series. And a trailer for Cannibal Holocaust, which they released on their Vault of Horror collection and is worth watching alone just for the soundtrack. If you can listen to the soundtrack in any way, then do. It's amazing. So, a very flawed film this week. If you're a fan of Jarlo and you've seen most of the better ones, then you might get something out of this. There is another release of this as well on Blu-ray by 88 Films. But for most people, I'd just say it's okay and you can watch a hell of a lot better. And next week, we might be watching something a bit better because we've got another Falshi film. And we're going to be taking a look at... City of the Living Dead. So, City of the Living Dead. Turns out this film is the first part of a trilogy called the Gates of Hell trilogy, directed by Lucio Fulci. And the second part is a film we've actually already covered, uh, The Beyond, which we covered in episode 3. And the third part is House by the Cemetery, which we'll be covering in uh, episode 10, I believe. Episode 10. Um, so, City of the Living Dead. It's a uh, 1980s Italian zombie film, directed by Lucio Fulci, and starring uh, Caterina McCall, who was also in The Beyond. Um, it's very similar in plot to The Beyond, uh, being centred around the gates of hell opening up. Uh, this time we follow a clairvoyant called Mary, and she has a vision of a priest hanging himself in a cemetery, and this causes the gates of hell to open itself up under a small town called Dunwich. Uh, that's a Lovecraftian town, by the way, used in a lot of Lovecraft's books. Um, so, Mary meets a reporter, and the two set out to stop the living dead. There's a lollipop in the glove box. I really enjoyed this film. There's not that much bad to say about it, really. Uh, the acting was fine. Nowhere near as laughable. Either that or I'm getting used to it. Um, the sets were great. Really interesting use of lighting and some really cool shots. Uh, the pacing was a lot of fun. And there's some really interesting effects that they use as well. There's like a snowstorm of maggots and there's like walls cracking and windows smashing and there's these bits with fire where they're like there's like a reverse shot sort of thing going on it's all really interesting stuff uh, the highlight of course though is the violence and gore and this film is full of it straight out of the gate <laughs> uh. 
There's some really interesting zombies too. A lot of them do look a bit like they've got a lot of vomit on the face. And they're looking like appear and disappear. I've not seen that one before. <laughs> One complaint is that the film does dip a little at the hour mark. There's about 10-15 minutes where I was a little bored. But the film does pick up towards the end, so it does make up for it. The big complaint though is the release. You probably noticed, but it's clearly a VHS rip. There's this massive flicker at the beginning and the image quality is really murky and grainy looking. Now it doesn't ruin the film. And in all honesty, this sort of aesthetic is kind of nostalgic, especially with this sort of film. Now let's look at the case. All Good Here Again sells the film really well. We get a quote from an editor called Mark Goldblatt. No errors, all good. Same logo as last week's used again though, which it is annoying because they haven't fixed the incorrect release. Ah oh well, I'm sure they'll figure it out eventually. And now for the special features. There are quite a few here. Uh, we get the usual suspects, you know, chapter select, stills, filmographies. And the trailers unfortunately are duplicates this week. We get two, we get Cannibal Holocaust and Shogun Assassin again. But we also get audio commentary and an interview, both with the uh, actor of this, Catriona uh, McCall. Now I've not listened to the audio commentary, but it might be an interesting listen, and hey, at least they're trying. But the interview is a bit of a difficult one to sit through. She clearly doesn't like the film, and she comes across as a little bit bitter, and it makes it quite an uncomfortable sit. For me at the time, um, they weren't the best scripts in the world. So as I was saying, life has uh, moved on since then, and uh, thank goodness it has. And I... So, overall, this is a great film and a must-watch for zombie fans. I'd even say that it's better than The Beyond, and probably the best film in this series that I've seen so far. Now, Arrow have put out a really amazing looking edition of this on Blu-ray, so I'd definitely say grab that one over this, as this release does leave a lot to be desired. So, a great Fulci film this week, and next week we're taking a look at something a little different, with The Deadly Spawn. God, that looks ridiculous. Alright. Well, I'm not, because I just watched The Deadly Spawn, and it's not very good. So, it's a 1983 American sci-fi horror film, directed by Douglas McEwen. And it turns out it's the only film he's ever made. Good. So the plot's pretty straightforward. It's about a meteorite hits Earth and it's got aliens in it. And the aliens proceed to attack a small town, which includes a small group of student scientists, a bunch of old ladies, and a kid who likes monsters. Now it's only 78 minutes long, but it feels about four hours. <laughs> so where do I start with this then? Well the plot is really bland. Nothing much really happens in between the aliens appearing and the acting is not laughably bad, it's dull bad, unfortunately. The setting's really uninteresting, just a bunch of people's houses and basements. Didn't even notice the music. 
and the gore and visual effects are nothing special at all. Worst of all though is that the monster looks like this. But you know what made this whole thing worse? It was the print. <laughs> it looks like shit. It's clearly a VHS strip and there's flickering and graying like all the way throughout. And the sound as well, the sound is terrible. You can barely understand what people are saying and half the time they sound like they're talking through mud. Now, I was thinking I'm not sure if I'd have enjoyed the film any more if the print and the release had been a bit better. But you know, it would have been nice to understand what people were saying half the time. Let's have a look at the case then. Again, everything's fine. Very short, I guess they didn't have too many nice things to say. At least all the information's right, and this is the start of some of the taglines that I always associate with Vipco. Now the logo, different again, but it goes back to the original one this week, that lovely VHS one. Love it. Best part of this whole release. Well, let's see what we get on the disc. Nothing. We get chapter select, filmographies, stills, and two duplicate trailers, Psychic Killer and Shogun Assassin again. Very disappointing compared to last episode. But then again, so is this whole thing. I would not recommend this film, or this release, and don't listen to that all movie review quoted on Wikipedia. Engaging unrealistic characters, they must have been watching a different film to me. Or maybe I just weren't in the mood for it. Anyway. Let's hope that next week's film's a hell of a lot better, and it should be, because we're going to be taking a look at Toby Hooper's Death Trap. Alright, so this week I checked out Death Trap and I was pleasantly surprised. Now, I, I do quite like Toby Hooper's films, really like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, and this one didn't disappoint. So it's a 1976 American slasher horror film, and Toby Hooper's third film, coming directly after Texas Chainsaw. Uh, it's more commonly known as Eaten Alive, not to be confused with Eaten Alive, directed by Umberto Lenzi, and we're gonna be covering this one in episode nine, I believe. Uh, so the plot to Death Trap is pretty straightforward really. It's about a crazy killer named Judd who runs a hotel and owns an alligator, but he refers to it as a croc. It's violent, it's sleazy, and it's very dirty. It's a very well made little film, if not a little aimless. The plot is basically people show up to this hotel and judge with his alligator, kill them or they fight back. So a little lacking, but this is made up for with the acting and casting. The villain, Judd in particular, is very watchable. He like goes from happy to sad really fast, and he's always rambling and mumbling to himself trying to justify his actions. We also get a great performance from Robert Englund, playing a character called Buck, and he says a line that most people will probably be familiar with. A 
And we also get a Brian De Palma regular, William Finlay, who's playing a very bizarre father. Name's Buck. I'm rearing to fuck. This film is filthy through and through. The main colours used are greys, greens and browns. Everything's dirty and grotty and covered in a thick mist. There's even a few sleazy scenes thrown in there for good measure. The print as well is this really low quality film, which for this sort of film works perfectly. It really makes your skin crawl. And the sound design is excellent as well. It's jarring and twisty and weird, and it really adds to the uncomfortable atmosphere. We are a little bit let down by the violence. It's nothing too special. I do quite like the scythe going through the neck part though, that one's fun. Uh, but most of the violence is done off screen or in really quick cuts so you can't really see what's happening too well. Now, let's talk about this alligator. It's a bit of a letdown. It's mainly just this naff looking puppet. And I'm not even sure if they used a real alligator at all in the whole film. It does make for some funny scenes though. <laughs> And time for the case. All seems fine. Sells the film really well. Info correct. All good. No tagline, unfortunately, though. Now, the old logo's used again this time. Great stuff. And we get nothing new with this release. Chapter select stills and filmographies, and the same two trailers again. So, Shogun Assassin and Psychic Killer. Bit lazy, but oh well. Overall, though, really liked this film. It was a great little video nasty that makes you feel like you need a shower afterwards. If it does look interesting to you, this release is fine for the sort of film that it is. But there is a nice Blu-ray out there by Arrow that's probably worth your time. So, good film this time. And next time, we're going to be taking a look at the shortest film in the whole Scream Time collection. Drive-In Massacre. So, it's time to take a look at the shortest film in the entire Screen Time collection. Coming in at just 70 minutes long, we've got Drive-In Massacre. And it is by far the worst film in this series that I've seen yet. How can a film so short feel so dragged on? I want to start by talking about the release. So the print and audio in this are awful. I spent most of my time straining to try and figure out what people were saying and the print quality is muddy and it's got scratches and flickers all the way throughout. It's clearly a very low grade film print. But I don't really know what I was expecting from a 70 minute long film called Drive-In Massacre. Jesus, does anybody have homes to do it in anymore? So, this is a 1976 slasher film, bit of a stretch there, directed by Stu Seagal, 
no relation to Stephen, and he's mainly known for directing porn. Now the plot is virtually non-existent here. We've got a guy killing people at a drive through cinema, and two cops trying to figure out who the killer is. It's about your lot, really. So what makes this film so bad? Well, the main issue has got to be the pacing. There are lots of long, drawn-out conversation scenes that just lead to dead ends, and the amount of dead ends in this film are infuriating. Also, the killer. Uh, I hope you don't mind spoilers about this, by the way. The killer is the guy that you meet right at the beginning of the film who's angry and is obviously the killer. And the kills aren't that interesting, maybe except for the first few at the beginning of the film. And the characters are virtually non-existent. Overall, it makes for a forgettable and dull set. <laughs> Then I had my accident. Well, where is this collection now? Do you have any of it? Oh, no. Mr. Van Neusen has it. He takes it with him everywhere he goes. I think it's in India. Mr. Van Neusen's in Hawaii. It tries its hand at being funny, but it just lands flat on its face. And it also tries its hand at suspense. But it'll probably just put you to sleep, really. Um. The most interesting part that I found was this dude. Uh, he plays one of the suspects and another dead end in the plot, but he's played by a guy called George Buck Flower. Now, he co-wrote and produced this mess, but he's in a whole bunch of films that you've probably seen, including a few John Carpenter films like Escape from New York and The Fog. And he's also in a bunch of other famous films like Back to the Future 2, uh, Pumpkinhead and Maniac Cop, just to name a few. He's probably the most enjoyable part of this film, but I got more enjoyment out of researching him than watching this piece of shit. I, I, I'm just gonna wait right here. quickly mention the ending. I'm sure none of you are going to mind me spoiling the ending for you. Uh, so the big twist is that the killer is now on the loose and he's broken through and he's in your drive-in cinema. And you can probably see the issues there. It does come across as pretty pathetic when you just sat comfortably at home watching this on DVD. Well, let's take a look at the case. There's a grammar error right here, no capital letter on teenagers, but the rest of the info is correct. The synopsis really rambles on there. Guess they had no idea what to say about this one. We get another tagline, which is always fun. Also though, the logo is back to being Vault of Horrors again for some reason. A quick aside, they should have included the trailer for this film on the DVD, because it's famous for misspelling the title twice. Shows how much they cared about this one, really, doesn't it? We get nothing new again with the release. No special features again outside of stills, filmographies and chapter select. And we just get a bunch of repeated trailers. Overall then, this was really boring. With few kills and even fewer moments of interest. And the print was abysmal, definitely making this the worst film in the collection so far. If for some reason you want to check it out with better print, an 88 films have got you covered with a Blu-ray. But if you want my opinion, avoid it. So, awful, awful film this time. The next time might be a little bit better, as we're going to be taking a look at... Umberto Lenzi's Eaten Alive. So next up, I took a look at Eaten Alive, not to be confused of course with Eaten Alive, also known as Death Trap, which is a film covered in episode 7. No, this Eaten Alive is a 1980s Italian cannibal exploitation film, 
directed by Umberto Lenza, who is best known for directing Cannibal Ferox, which I haven't seen, but I've heard it's pretty good. So this is another 80s cannibal film that's riding the trend set by Cannibal Holocaust, but I did really enjoy this one. It's about a woman called Sheila, whose sister Diane gets lost in the jungle with some cult, so Sheila, with the help of her guide Mark, sets out to try and find them, but they get caught between the cult and a cannibalistic tribe. It's a lot of fun, and I'll start you off by showing some ridiculous bits of acting, because this film has got loads of them. Merry Christmas and have a balloon! That guy looks like a criminal. I'm scared, Mark. Come on. Get up. Get up, Sheila. Come on. Get up and walk. We're gonna get out of this alive, understand? I'm gonna do it. Now get up and walk. The price that I'm paying for having fallen for Jonas in New York is glorious laws of purification. Oh my God, I've been such a fool. While the characters on the whole are quite unlikable, the bad accents and terrible lines of dialogue can make it quite charming at times. Mark is trying to be cool, and the cult leader Jonas is definitely trying to do his best Clint Eastwood face throughout most of the film. Now, this is an Italian cannibal film, so you're going to get your weird bits in it. This animal cruelty in this, uh, it does seem to cut it before it gets a little too gratuitous, but it is still there. There's misogynistic scenes, there's racist scenes, there's sleazy sexual scenes, and Weirdly of all, this film's got a real thing for smacking women. Give me a mush. I don't want to hear that again. No! No! For a cannibal film, though, this is really lacking in the cannibalism department. At first I thought that the film was quite heavily cut, so I checked it out on the BBFC website, but now apparently this is a fully uncut version. Most of the violence is implied, and there's only a few scenes of cannibalism that I can actually remember. It does make up for it though with some great shots, some fantastic sets, and some really fun music. The editing's a little bit weird though. to try. I'm not about to give in, too. A few weird bits I wanted to mention. There's a Godfather reference in this, for no reason. And while Eaten Alive and Death Trap do share a namesake, they also share alligator scenes. For some reason, I mean, Death Trap's full of alligator scenes, but there's one quite big alligator scene in Eaten Alive. And I must say, it's better in Eaten Alive, even though it's the main focus of Death Trap. Eaten Alive has got the better alligator attack scene. Also, at the beginning, there's a large billboard for Frank Zappa's Baby Snakes. It's not that weird, I just, I'm just a bit of a fan, so I fancy mentioning it. I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. I give you one dollar. <laughs> So you probably notice that the print isn't grey, it's a very low grade film, there's loads of scratches and grain, but for this sort of thing, it works okay. Also, no problems with the sound, it's clear and everything sounds really good. When was the last time you had news of your sister? In the murderer's pocket. What is it? It's an 8mm colour film. Okay, now for the case. All fine and good, sells the film well, no mistakes. No intro logo this week though, just a weird warning at the beginning. And this might be the most professional looking menu I've ever seen on a Vipco film. And let's see what we get on the disc. Nothing again. Chapter select, stills, and two repeater trailers, psychic killer, and shogun assassin. Again. It's getting kind of frustrated how lazy they're being. Overall though, really enjoyed this film. Now, 
If you're a little sensitive to things like animal cruelty or sexual violence, I'd probably avoid this one. But if that doesn't faze you, and you're a fan of Italian cannibal films, this is a must watch. It's fun and it's stupid in all the right places. I think if you're in the UK, this is all we've got as far as releases go. But if you find it for cheap, it's well worth picking up. So, good film this episode. The next episode, we're going to be finishing off the Gates of Hell trilogy as we take a look at Lucio Fulci's The House by the Cemetery. Alright, so this week I finished the Gates of Hell trilogy and watched House by the Cemetery and it was alright. Unfortunately though, nowhere near as good as the other two in the trilogy, The Beyond and City of the Living Dead. Not by a long shot. So, it's a 1981 Italian zombie horror film, directed of course by Lucio Fulci, and once again starring Catriona McCall. If you like gore, bad dubbing, and a zombie or two, then I'd say you're in the right place. So where do the gates of hell open up this time then? Well, they don't really. No, the uh, plot is about a family who move into a house where a colleague of the husband, who's a doctor, went crazy and murdered his family. Turns out the house is built on top of a cemetery, not by a cemetery, and the basement is inhabited by the late Dr. Freudstein, who is now a zombie, and definitely wins the award for most ridiculous name. And he sometimes kills people. Now the main problem is probably the pacing. There's a lot of long exposition scenes, and there's not much violence, and I think the zombies only in it a handful of times. Luckily though, the violence and gore that we do get are really well made. There's some decent set design, although there are instances where, for example, the bookshelf has clearly got just pictures of books on it instead of actual books. There's little oddities like that thrown throughout. The music's great. The acting and dubbing, for the most part, is passable. Far too much screaming, though. The worst part of that, though, is the children. Uh, the little boy is clearly being dubbed by a grown woman, and the little girl just cannot figure out her accent. What isn't stupid, though, is the zombie. The design is grey, it's twisted and weird, and I think it looks amazing. And it cries like a child, which is really creepy. I'm here. Behind you. On the other side of the street. My name is Bob. My daddy's here to do some research. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a scene of note, and one that is definitely in line with Fulcher, is the bat scene. It goes on and on, and this bat's getting stabbed and stabbed, and it's very, very similar in pacing to, uh, to the spider scene in The Beyond. Although slightly not as good as that, for this film, it's a real standout moment. Right, let's talk about this print. So the image quality is flat out bad. It looks like a bad film print and a VHS rip combined. Worst of all though, the image is cropped, meaning that you're losing either side of it. So things like credits and even the title are completely cut off in certain sections. And it means that the whole framing for the film is just thrown out the window. 
At first, I thought it was an issue with the TV settings and I'm faffing around trying to figure out how to get it to look right. But no, it was the release. They just didn't care. And I think it might make this one of, if not the worst, print that we've seen so far. Now for the case. All fine, really. This bit looks a little bit weird, but that's all. The old incorrect logo is back again. No consistency. Also, this menu looks terrible. You can barely read the text with that font. And let's see what we get on the disc. I think you all know by now what we bloody get on the disc. Sing along with me, everyone. We get stills, filmographies, chapter select, and trailers. And yes, the repeated trailers. We get Cannibal Holocaust, Psychic Killer, Mountain of the Cannibal Gods. What's that? No Shogun Assassin? Who'd have thought, eh? <sighs> I really hope that they start mixing these up a little bit. I'm getting a little bored. Overall, though, House by the Cemetery. It was okay. It was okay. Uh, it suffers a little bit with its story and its pacing, but it makes up for it with its effects and its gore, even if there's not too much of it. I mean, it's only 80 minutes, so it doesn't really overstay its welcome. Uh, if you're wanting a better quality version of it, which I'd recommend, Arrow have got you covered, and hopefully theirs fits on the screen properly. So let's have a look at the Gates of Hell trilogy overall. Would I recommend it? Definitely. Definitely, if you're a fan of gory films, horror films, Italian, badly dubbed, funny films, these are fantastic watches. Uh, they do unfortunately get worse in quality as they go along. Uh, I would definitely, definitely recommend these two. City of the Living Dead and The Beyond are fantastic. This one's okay as a little follow-up, a little aside. So, uh, interesting watch this time, and next time it's going to get even more interesting. So we're going to be taking a look at... Island of Death. Ooh. Her husband, an early riser, has an encounter with a young girl. Alright. So checked out Island of Death and it's a weird one to figure out really uh, so it's a 1976 uh, Greek film directed by Nico Mastarakis who I'd never heard of and it's shot on the Greek island of Mykonos with a bunch of English speaking actors now if you remember in the last episode I read a little snippet out from the back of the case uh, that seemed a little dubious and my suspicions were correct this is a very sleazy film that is full of sex scenes. I counted 13 in total, and that includes two rape scenes and a scene of bestiality. To juxtapose this though, there's some very nice colourful shots of Greece, and it's probably the brightest film of the whole collection so far. Mykonos is called. Nothing more than a deserted rock, white houses and small narrow streets. What's there? Yeah, what is that? Oh, it's only a room. Can we have that as well? Yes, it's something more that can make you smile. I can't live a moment without you. So what's this film all about then? Well, I think I'll let uh, past me read the back of the box for you because I don't think I could sum it up in any better way really. Oh and uh, spoilers by the way. Celia is a puzzle. Is she the innocent victim of, an, of a manipulative husband or is she the mastermind of all evil? In the moonlight Celia provokes those who might peek through the transparent curtains while her husband, an early riser, has an encounter with a young girl. An encounter that leads to murder, blood, and the sacrificial beast. 
Anything and anyone who comes into contact with them must die. A painter, crucified in a churchyard while the two watch, holding their breath. To end the suffering of a bucket full of lime. Then the cleansing of a small island begins. A gay couple is sentenced to death, every moment recorded in black and white. The small town streets are quiet, with the exception of his pain. As he holds on to his spilled guts, slash after slash from the ancient sword, he dies. Slash after slash, he's loving it. Back at the dollhouse, the young one is hurt. To ease the pain, he plays sexual games with a loaded weapon. Oops, the trigger is pulled by accident. It's mind blowing. <laughs> The cleansing continues. Next target, the only two gay women on the island. The only man who can go after them is ha is hang up somewhere else. And what about that? What about that older woman who knows how? Who loves to be roughed up in bed? She wants him so badly she loses her head. Bit of rhyming there. Um, Celia is brutally attacked in her own bathtub, but the punishment of the brute is swift and fierce. He speared. Last stop, the dyke. I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> he uses an aerosol spray as a torch, some 450 degrees of pure heat, and fires the bitch to hell. And while things have started to go their way, one of the victims escapes, his fury and sickle. But not for long, pursued by the police, they seek shelter in God's arms, and then a shepherd's hut, where new adventures begin. <laughs> new film loaded and at... New film loaded and the camera ready, but no happy ending for him as he lies unconscious in dry lime. Celia has discovered the meaning of crude, primitive sex, while her husband, who was never her husband, but her brother, starts to melt when rain turns dry lime into pure acid. So yeah, that rambling that you just heard there was the entire plot of the film written on the back of the case. Uh, what little plot there actually is to this film. Um, as I said, it's quite sleazy and full of sex scenes, and in between those, there's uh, scenes of little scenes of violence. Uh, it's not very gory. Um, there's just a little bit of blood, and then the rest's left up to your imagination. Ah! Ah! Get up! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> The big problem is that all of the characters are very unlikable. Now, the acting is passable, but only in the sense of it's not so bad that you're laughing all the way through, but it is by no means good. The music's got some interesting parts to it, there's this one song that just keeps playing over and over again, and I must admit, it's kind of catchy, but it's weird because it does kind of divulge into just screaming about getting a sword. Uh, one thing I did notice as well is uh, there's some parallels to A Clockwork Orange, which I'm not sure if it's intentional or not. Uh, obviously the themes, like sex and violence. Uh, the main character drinks milk. Uh, he has an internal monologue narration going on in his head, and he looks a little bit like a young Malcolm McDowell. As I say, could just be a coincidence there. So probably the most interesting aspect of this film is just the absurdity of it all. It's a very aimless film and there's very long, boring, drawn out scenes. But interspersed into these is just the most bizarre acts and ideas that these characters insist on being a part of. It makes for a very strange set, and I found myself asking why a hell of a lot. Oh, There's a few strange editing choices, such as the use of fisheye lens and uh, inverted colours. All seems a little amateurish, but it's not the end of the world and honestly it kind of adds to the surreal nature of everything. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that this film is cut by four minutes. Uh, the aerosol flamethrower scene and the big rape scene are heavily edited. Well, uh, 
lost the moment when I started thinking about the little red book. <laughs> So let's look at this print. Seems all right, really. It's not the best, it's not the worst, it's just sort of somewhere in the middle. Clearly it's a VHS rip, and you get flickers and scratches, but not enough to sort of hinder your experience with the film, and it's quite passable, really. The colours are really bright and vivid, and they really pop out of the screen, but it can cause some interlacing issues, such as on this dude's red jumper. The sound, very much the same, it's okay, middle of the road, and uh, there's the occasional pop, but it doesn't hinder it in any way. I just think of it, Patricia lying in bed. Now, let's have a look at this bloody case. <laughs> so you've already heard me read it out, but there's a few errors here too. Firstly this bit here, where there's no space between speared and last. Also this bit, where it says, is hang up somewhere else? And here, pretty sure roughened up in bed isn't right. Finally, another missed space here, between hell and and. Mostly though, I just can't believe it tells you the entire plot. Ending twist and all. Never seen a case do that before. And some of the ways that it says things. Oops, the trigger is pulled by accident. and. He's loving it. Sounds like a carry-on film. But anyway, outside of that, everything else is right. We get another incorrect logo at the beginning again, it's the Vault of Horror one. That description though, ridiculous. Time to see what we get on the disc. And I think someone must have overheard me moaning last episode, because outside of the usual stuff, all four trailers are present here. We also get a 25 minute long interview with the director. Now, the quality is not great, but the interview itself is quite interesting. He talks about how he only made this film so that he could get money, so that he could fund his next film. He doesn't really seem passionate about this film, but he doesn't regret making it either, and he'll never show it to his daughter. He's got some decent opinions on censorship and the BBFC, and generally just comes across quite well. And sometimes the story behind the movie is more interesting than the story in the movie itself. And uh, Island of Death is no different. Overall then, this was a very bizarre set. Its themes can be quite extreme. So if you're sensitive to things like rape, bestiality and sexual violence, then I'd probably avoid it. In honesty though, even if you're not sensitive to that sort of stuff, I don't think I could recommend this film. It's dull, it's aimless, and it goes on for far too long. If for some reason this video has piqued your interest and you are going to check it out, don't bother with this version, get the Arrow version, it's fully uncut. So, weird film this week. Next week, we're going back to the jungle as we take a look at... Mountain of the Cannibal God. Alright, so this week, got around to watching one that I've kind of been looking forward to. Mountain of the Cannibal God. I mean, I've seen the trailer enough times for it, I'm not surprised that the marketing actually worked on me. But you know what? It was pretty good. So it's a 1978 Italian cannibal film, directed by Sergio Martino, and starring Ursula Andress, who's probably best known as one of the Bond girls. And the back of the box really wants you to know that, whilst also advertising her in a bit of an old-fashioned way. If you like your sleazy cannibal exploitation films with a good dose of gore, then you'll probably be interested in this. Mountain of the Cannibal God. You mean the Pukas are cannibals? That's right. 
plot to this is very typical for the genre. So a woman's husband goes missing in the jungle, and so along with her brother and a worldly row, they set off to try and find him, with twists and turns along the way. It's full of tropes that you'd expect from this type of film, but it does them very well and creates a very watchable experience, and only really suffers in the pacing department. The acting's surprisingly good here as well. There's a few daft lines, but overall, pretty well acted for this sort of film. And the violence is top notch as well. You get decapitations, disembowelings, and a knob getting cut off. Now, I would definitely refer to this film as a sleazy film. But in all honesty, it's not as sleazy as I was expecting it to be. You only get a couple of nude scenes, uh, there's one attempted sex scene, and one attempted rape scene. I guess to make up for this though, the animal cruelty is through the roof. Not nice. Outside of the gruesome stuff though, the film actually manages to create some quite tense scenes, and the jungle, which is a jungle in Sri Lanka, really creates a claustrophobic setting and it really heightens the chase scenes and it really adds to the overall mood. Something of note, uh, there were a few scenes in this film that I really felt like I'd seen before. Turns out, Eaten Alive, that we covered in episode 9, just straight up rips scenes from cannibal films, including this one. So jarring, I mean, I've only seen this recently, so it's really weird to see. Now, I can't show you the scenes here, because they are the scenes of animal cruelty. Guess this film just really wanted some animals getting killed, but just didn't want to do it itself. Maybe you're still being chased by the ghost of your cannibals. That's right! You don't forget the taste of human flesh! Now with the print, we get something a little different here. Uh, the quality is so-so. It's a little fuzzy, but it's passable. Same for the audio, really, except for the river scene, where you can barely understand a word anyone's saying. Now the weird part of this is the aspect ratio. So it starts out as a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, which is sort of like super wide screen. And then it, after the credits at the beginning, it zooms in to this weird 16 by 9, which is really annoying because you notice that people are cut out of the frame and the frame is just completely off. And then just before the end credits, zooms back out again to the uh, 2.35 by 1. Never seen that before. Let's look at this case then. Much better than last week's, really sells the film, outside of an unfortunate bit of sexism. All the information's correct, although I did think that the runtime was off, but it isn't. For some reason, the trailer for the film is tacked on at the end of it. Close one though, I thought we were getting some uh, dead of night territory there. It calls the film one of the best cannibal films you'll ever see, and you know what, of this genre, I think I'll give it that. Also, Vault of Horrors logo again. I think that might be three in a row now. Incorrect consistency. And we're back to the usual again with what's on the disc. Chapter select stills, filmographies and three trailers. Cannibal Holocaust, Psychic Killer and of course, the trailer for this. Overall, really enjoyed this one. I thought it was an excellent example of a 70s Italian cannibal exploitation film. Now, if you're sensitive to things like animal cruelty, or rape, then I'd avoid it. If that sort of stuff don't bother you and you're a fan of the genre, then this one's definitely worth checking out. Uh, this print is okay, apart from the weird aspect ratio thing. Uh, there is a Blu-ray out there though by Shameless, if you wanted an upgrade. Overall then, decent film this week. Next week, who the hell knows? Because we're going to be taking a look at The Mutilator. What a title. Alright, 
So this week, I checked out The Mute Layer, and it is a very middle-of-the-road slasher film, with some great bits and some terrible bits. So it's from 1984, and is the only film directed by Buddy Cooper. It's got the plot to every slasher film you've ever seen. A bunch of horny teenagers go stay in an isolated house overnight, and they get picked off one by one by a slow movie maniac, who the film gives away in the first 20 minutes. So don't go into this expecting any sort of mystery. I'm gonna set a new high score on Video Machine. I'm gonna watch. Characters are as archetypal as they come, with the acting ranging from laughably bad to passable. This guy in, in particular, called Mike, is hilarious with some of his line delivery, and I'm kind of getting a young and deranged Hank Hill vibe from him. Also, the main guy, Ed, kind of reminds me of a young Bruce Campbell, which isn't a bad thing. The highlight has got to be the kills and gore effects, the brutal and well made. Unfortunately, though, they are quite infrequent. Jeez, would you look at all this shit? Rah, rah. Will that hurt you? No, in fact, it probably prevents herpes. The music's of note as well. Uh, there's this song that plays at the beginning and the end, and it's really fun and cheesy, and it fits really well, gets you sort of excited to watch the film. But unfortunately, I'd say that that is where the good stuff ends. The main problem would be the pacing. Uh, around 30 minutes in, I found myself getting a little bored. And it didn't really pick up again until the last 10 minutes of the film. So there's this scene where they're playing Blind Man's Bluff in the dark. And it's on for about 6 to 7 minutes. And it's just sort of them creeping around the house very quietly in the dark. But that's the problem. You can't really see what's happening. And to be honest, that's kind of the case for the last third of this film. It's just far too dark. I found myself saying, turn the lights on. Not because it would have been a smart move for them to do in the film, but because I just wanted to see what was happening. Print's fine, really. Average, sort of low budget DVD quality. Very few flickers, not too many. I uh, did notice a stutter, but that might have been on my end. It was almost like a, the frame freezes for just like a split second. Could have been my PS4, not really sure on that one. Uh, also, there is a massive dip in quality as the credits start, the opening credits. And, but when they finish, it's all fine and normal again. So I think that might be something to do with the print. Maybe the tile overlays, maybe the dropping quality there. Again, not sure on that one either. Let me know. When the leaves of summer turn red and gold. Okay, case time. All fine, really. Runtime is one minute off, but that's excusable. Sells the film quite well on the back, although these screenshots are far too dark. Guess I should have seen the last third of the film coming, really. No logos at the beginning this time, just a warning. Very odd. First time that's happened, I think. And let's see what we get on the desk. Not a whole lot this time. Chapter select, stills, and two trailers. Psychic Killer and Shogun Assassin. Very minimal this week. Overall then, this is kind of a bottom of the barrel slasher film. There's some fun moments and some good kills, but it suffers massively in the pacing department. If you've run out of slasher films to watch, then you might get something from this. Uh, and if you want an upgrade, there is a Blu-ray available by Arrow Films. 
Hopefully they've sorted out the last third so you can actually see what the hell's happening. So, mixed bag this week. Who knows what we're going to get next week as we take a look at one of the strangest titles in the collection so far. Pranks. So this week, I checked out Oliver Twisted. Not really, that was a prank, because I actually checked out Pranks, as you can probably tell by the title of the video. Got you there, didn't I? So it's another slasher film, but it's a very boring one. So Pranks, otherwise known as The Dorm That Drips Blood, which is a much more appropriate title, is a 1982 American slasher film directed by Stephen Carpenter, no relation to John, and it stars Daphne Zuniga in her film debut. So, there is a plot here, it's not much of one, but there is a plot. Five college kids are looking after a building, which is about to be closed down, and they get killed off one by one by a crazy killer. It's about your lot, really. Alright, that sounds great! You know, today I put snow tires on my Jeep, so we're going to be in good shape. All right, you know what? Ah! As previously stated, then, it is a very boring set. It's a lot of slowly moving around in the dark through corridors shouting each other's names. The characters are inoffensive to the point of being slightly offensive, and the acting is just passable. It's not hilariously bad, and it's not amazing either. It'd almost be a competent film, if more things happened. There's a twist at the end, but it's handled terribly, the reveal is ridiculous. And spoilers for the end of the film, I'm sure you're not really going to mind me spoiling the end of the film, but it's one of the only interesting parts really. Uh, the bad guy actually wins at the end, but they don't really do anything with it. He just wins and then the film ends. Bit of a missed opportunity, really. Um, a lot of the kills are done off screen, which is a shame, but some of the kills are actually some of the highlights of the film, really. There's two scenes that stand out to me. Um, there's one where the girl gets her head run over by a car. You don't see much, but the sound design is really good for it. And then there's the scene towards the end where all the bodies of the dead are revealed. And some effects are quite good there, it's quite, a, quite an effective scene. My biggest issue though, is that there is only one prank in the whole film. And it's a pathetic one at that. Greg. <laughs> Come on, what are you screaming about? It's my egg. Greg! <laughs> <laughs> the release is standard for a low budget horror film really. It's a low quality print but it's watchable, there's a few flickers and a few blue streaks but that's about your lot really. And same old stuff on the disc as well. Chapter select stills, filmographies and three repeated trailers. Case time. It's fine. Very short, which isn't a surprise. This bit's worded weirdly though. Everyone is not successful. It reads a little garbled. Screenshots are nice and all the info's correct. The logo's back again, and it's the Vault of Horror one again. It's a shame they didn't make a screen time one. Overall then. This is a run-of-the-mill, badly-paced slasher film that neither succeeds in being scary or funny. There are some interesting ideas muddled into this, but just not enough to make it a worthwhile sit. It's not the worst film in the world, it's just very middle of the road. If you are interested in watching this, then this Vipco release is your lot. There's no Blu-ray release in the UK unless you're wanting to import, but I wouldn't waste your time or money on that. So, bit of a disappointment this week. 
but I think that things are going to get a little better next week. So we're going to be taking a look at Bruno Matai's Rats. Alright, so this week I checked out Rats. Now, I've got a very fond memory of drunkenly watching this with a friend one time. And re-watching it sober, it doesn't disappoint. It is masterfully made stupid air. So, more commonly known with the subtitle included Rats, Night of Terror, it's a 1984 post-apocalyptic horror film directed by Bruno Matar, who's best known for doing a bunch of really sleazy sexploitation films. And also co-directing Zombie Flesh Eaters 2 with Lucio Fulci, which we'll be covering later on in the series. So there's a hell of a lot of rats in this, and there's a hell of a lot of bad dubbing. I'm gonna warm their whiskers. Oh, oh, oh you know! Oh, Look at them! Oh, this is sugar! <laughs> The film starts with narration and a text crawl. Seems a little overkill, really. It tells us that a bomb went off in the year 2015 and uh, wiped out most of the population of the Earth. So now we follow on 225 years after this and we follow a bunch of dickheads as they find an old abandoned building. And it seems ideal for them because it's got a lot of food and water. But it's also got a lot of mutated rats that eat people. So it follows a slasher formula where uh, a bunch of people getting killed and the group's trying to figure out who did it and how it can be stopped. It's a lot of silly fun and scenes generally boil down to people overreacting over a bunch of bored and harmless looking rats. From that moment begins the era that will come to be called After the Bomb. Here come the rats! <laughs> Open up! For God's sake! Right! Wait! Keep moving! Don't stop! Watch it! I can't stand it anymore! As I previously said then, this film is full of hilariously bad dubbing. And it really brings the film to life. Every character's got their own little quirk, and the character Lilith, in particular, is worth keeping your eyes on because she has some brilliant delivery. Outside of that, the pacing's pretty good. Keeps you engaged for most of the film until, say, around the last 20 minutes or so. It kind of gets a little bit drawn out. There's a great twist at the end, though, and it really got me laughing. The sets and the costumes are very fitting for an 80s post-apocalypse film, almost like the apocalypse happened and this group could only get the clothes from a local theatre costume department. Kind of feels a bit like a theatre play, actually. Um, when the gang's all together, they're all sort of stood in one big line facing the camera, and uh, the bit towards the beginning where they're checking out the building, I expect them to burst into song at any minute. Let's see. I'll make you pregnant. If you can make that thing work. How could it happen? How could it happen? In the, in the cell, we found strange and wonderful things! Christ, you dirty beast! That's why our water gets polluted! Shit! The violence and gore is pretty good, even if we don't get a lot of it. There's some pretty good corpses, and the rats coming out of people look quite fun, especially the exploding ones really are a hell of a lot of rats in this. Makes me wonder if it's one maybe to watch out for with like animal cruelty and such. We see a few getting knocked about, but as far as I can remember, there aren't any getting killed on camera, so not really sure. There's this great bit where it's trying to look like a bunch of rats are running towards the camera, but it's just a bunch of fake ones on a conveyor belt. It's really quite a cute effect, really. Luke, come on, stop on us! Save us if you hurry! Oh, 
Now for the print. And it's great this time around. Clear image, clear sound. Not much more I can really say on it. I mean, it's not like high quality or anything, but it's way better than I was expecting. And we get nothing new on the disc. Chapter select, stills, filmographies, and you guessed it, four repeated trailers. At least we get all four of them this time. And let's have a look at this case. All fine, nothing really to say here. It's short and to the point, and all the info's correct. Pretty good job here, Vipka. We get the Vault of Horrors logo again. It's expected at this point, though. Overall, then, this film is a lot of fun. It's silly and it's gory in all the right ways. I can definitely see myself popping this one on when friends come round. If you like post-apocalyptic films, gory films, or films with awful acting and dubbing in them, then this one is definitely worth checking out. There is a Blu-ray out there by 88 Films if you do fancy the upgrade, but honestly this one's fine, and if you see it out and about for cheap and you fancy checking it out, it's probably worth grabbing. So, decent film this week. About time we have one of those really. Next week, who knows, I think we're heading back to the slasher genre judging by the title but I've got no idea so we're going to be checking out The Slayer very generic title and look at that catching the sun The Slayer is a massive piece of shit. I was right, by the way. Last week, I guessed that it was going to be a slasher film, and it is, although I had no idea of how bad it was actually going to be. Don't really know what else I expected, though, from the guy that directed 8mm 2. So it's otherwise known as Nightmare Island, which is a much more appropriate title. It's a 1982 American horror film, shot out by J.S. Cardone. It's got a very, very generic plot for this sort of film. Two couples go on holiday to an isolated island, and they get killed off by an unknown. I guess it does try and do things a little differently. One of the characters is having premonitions and nightmares about the killings, but they don't really do anything with it. I was getting strong vibes of the Mutilator throughout this. Similar names, similar films, similar shitness. Oh boy. Brandy, my favorite kind. Mmm. Caviar, ugh. The characters are as two-dimensional as they come. They spend the whole film whinging, arguing, and then dying. The biggest issue is the pacing. Not a hell of a lot happens in this film, and there's lots and lots of just slowly walking through rooms in the dark, shouting out each other's names. I was really hoping it'd pick up towards the end, but in the last two minutes of the film, we get the reveal of the monster, and all it is is the shot that's on the back of the case and the menu. So, you see this? See this image here? Yeah, see that? Right, you've seen the end of the film. It's just a pan up to that, and then that's it, you're done. Although, in the last minute, just before the credits, there is another twist. And I'm going to spoil it, because it's the, it's the worst twist imaginable. It's the twist that they say, do not use this twist in your film. Of course, as Biggie Smalls once said, it was only a dream. What a cop-out. There were two things I did like about this. Uh, number one is the violence. It's quite well made, but it's very infrequent. And number two is the sets, again, very well made, and there's a great atmosphere to them. But these two things are not enough to save the film.
star of the show though has got to be The Prim. Not only is this one of the worst films we've seen in the collection so far, but it's also one of the worst DVD qualities we've seen. Jesus, it's got everything. Low grade film stock, VHS rip, massive flickers, snow, interlacing issues, sound bouncing up and down, colours moving out of place, lighting so bad that it makes the film barely watchable with how dark it gets, and I've heard that it's been cropped to a 4x3 aspect ratio. None of the, this, all this stuff really doesn't help the film and it, I think it made me dislike it a hell of a lot more. While we're here, let's have a look and see what's on the disc. Nothing new, same old stuff through repeated trailers. Nobody has been here for a long time. David was here last night. There's nothing here but an elevator and an empty shaft. I think the case might be the only competent thing here, really. Apart from giving away the only shot of the monster in the whole film. Which is understandable, though, as nothing else really happens. Everything else is fine, info's correct, and the synopsis sells the film without really lying to us. We get the same Vault of Horrors logo at the beginning again, and I'm kinda sick of saying this now. I don't think I'm gonna mention it again until something changes. Overall, then, this is as boring as they come. Terrible film, terrible quality, and one hell of a lazy ending. Don't get me wrong, there are a few interesting ideas in this, but none of them are executed well enough for me to ever want to recommend it to someone. If you are interested in fancy an upgrade, Arrow have got you covered on the Blu-ray front, and I've heard they fixed a bunch of the quality issues, but I still don't see it being an entertaining sim. So, terrible film this week, and honestly, Feeling a little bit burnt out. I'm going to make a little announcement now about what's going to happen with the rest of the series. So I'm deciding I'm going to split it in half. So I'll finish this half, we'll get up to around where I feel like halfway through the series is, and then we'll have a break, and the second half will begin airing in October 2021. But don't worry, there's still plenty more with this half. So join me next week as I check out the ridiculously named Spookies. Spookies. Hey, Spookies. Spookies. Alright. So, what the hell is Spookies all about then? Well, with a name like this, I was half expecting it to be some sort of Gremlins knockoff. Something along the lines of Ghoulies, maybe. But no, it turns out it's actually an Evil Dead style knockoff. And one hell of a mixed bag. So, it's a 1986 horror film from the US, directed by Brendan Faulkner and Thomas Doran, who never heard of them. Uh, with additional stuff being done by a guy called Eugene Joseph. Now, it turns out that this was originally going to be a film called Twisted Soul, but it never got finished. So this dude, Eugene, got the footage, shot a few extra bits, and turned it into this. Which makes a hell of a lot of sense. There's something in there! What are you, crazy? <laughs> Let's start off with the plot. So it's got a pretty run-of-the-mill haunted house storyline. Group of people enter a house, get killed off by the creatures who are all being controlled by this puppet master dude, and he has a very boring subplot about his dead wife or something. The characters are all very unlikable, but at least we get some funny line reads here and there to make up for it. I cannot stand the comic relief dude. He is far too stupid for my liking. I'm also struggling to figure out who these people are in relation to each other. I'm guessing they're all teenagers and friends, but this dude looks like a 40 year old dentist and nobody really seems to like each other very much. That's really nice. Well, it is a possibility, isn't it? I think we should go back by the front door. I like this room. 
I feel safe. Adrian. David. Come to me, my darling. I need you. A highlight and also a low point has definitely got to be the special effects. There's some pretty well made practical effects here and some quite impressive monster makeup, but then on the other hand, some of the monsters are dressed worse than a kid on Halloween and there's some really dodgy latex floating about. Such a weird hodgepodge of things. Which I guess can also be said for the pacing as well, as one minute it's throwing all these interesting ideas at you, and then it just stops dead for some slow wandering. It's like it's trying to build on tension, but there isn't any as the characters are really unlikable and the film keeps flitting about so you can't get invested in any of it. Two bits I wanted to mention. Uh, the first one is the scene in the basement where the monsters attack the young couple. Uh, the monsters seem pretty well made and pretty interesting, but the whole scene is just full of fart sound effects, which is such a strange choice. I'm wondering whether it's something that was added in the re-edit or something that was left over from the original. Either way, really strange choice. Uh, secondly, the film gets so caught up in this bride subplot that it completely forgets about as main characters, so we never know whether they live or die or what. Again, I'm guessing it's something to do with the changing director, maybe they didn't have enough footage of the original cast or something. Either way, it leaves for a very unsatisfying ending. <laughs> Let's have a look at this print. It's fine really. A few flickers and it's a little fuzzy. The colours can get a little weird and it's a tad dark at times, but it's completely passable for a Vipco film. Very much the same with the sound. Uh, although the Puppet Master dude does sound like he recorded a few of his lines through a tin can. And let's have a look on the disc. Same old stuff really. Three repeated trailers, chapter slight in a gallery. Nothing new. Let's take a look at the case. All seems fine really, apart from this little grammatical error, award-winning visual effect. Just the one, eh? Also the runtime is ever so slightly off, by like under a minute, so I'm really nitpicking there. I find this big image on the back a bit weird though. We haven't seen an image that takes up this much room on one of these before. Overall then, this is one hell of a weird sit. I was definitely entertained for parts of it, but for the rest of it I was just bored out of my mind. It's a shame as well, because some of the special effects are really fun and quite well made. I'm guessing that if Twisted Souls had come out instead of this, it would have been a hell of a lot better. Oh well, we got this instead. Uh, if you do want the upgrade and you're looking for a Blu-ray of this, then you're out of luck in the UK. This is your lot. Not that I'd particularly recommend this one anyway. So. Very mixed this time. Let's hope next week is a little bit better, because we're going to be taking a look at... Stage Fright. Alright, we're in for a treat this episode because Jesus Christ, Stage Fright is actually a really good film. So it's a 1987 Italian slasher film directed by a dude called Michel Soavi, who was a protege to Dario Argento. So you know we're in good hands there. And the film was also produced by a fellow called Joe D'Amato, who people who've seen the Dead of Night collection reviews might remember as directing Emmanuel and the Last Cannibals. If I remember correctly, this was a pretty good film as well. So Stage Fright definitely wears its Argento influences on its sleeves. 
and makes for a pretty good little slasher film. The plot centres around a group of actors who are putting on some weird abstract dance performance thing. Uh, one of the actors hurts her leg, so she goes to an insane asylum to get it sorted. Makes sense, I guess? Um, she accidentally brings back with her though a deranged serial killer, and he proceeds to kill off the actors one by one while dressed in an owl costume. Now as absurd as all this sounds, it does really work well. The characters are all quite stereotypical, but they are very watchable as well. Uh, the acting and dubbing is actually pretty good this time around. You get the odd line here and there that's a little strange, but it's to be expected with this sort of film, and honestly, I always think it adds to the fun. Sybil! Sybil, you on? Floor, and then you cut her into pieces. I don't want to hear! That's horrible! Peter? Open this door! Open the door! All right! The editing, pacing and cinematography are all top notch here. There's some really great shots and set pieces. The camera's quite active and it's not afraid to move around with people. It really helps with the tension and scenes like uh, where the actors are sneaking around in the dark are made a hell of a lot more interesting. It was refreshing finally seeing a film with some well-earned tension in it. It's quite a bright film as well and the colours really pop. It's definitely an Argento influence there. It's quite a modest film as well. I was expecting a little more sleaze in it, but no, there's only one scene of nudity and it's done from this weird, like, top-down angle, so you don't really see much. Speaking of not seeing much as well, a lot of the kills are done off-screen, but it kind of works well again in this. Uh, it comes across more as artful than cheap, and the kills that we do get have got some really good practical effects there, so it's kind of worth the build-up really love the killer. The owl mask is an excellent choice and there's some great shots of him sneaking around and popping up on people. finally done it. This print is great. It's clear and it doesn't look cheap at all both in the sound and visual department and I can honestly say that this is the best looking Vitco film yet. We don't get anything new on the disc but we do get everything that we usually get on the disc. We get all four trailers, chapters like stills and filmography. And would you believe it, the case is great too. Nice screenshots, all the info is correct, short and sweet, and it really sells the film. Overall then, this was a really great film and a lot of fun. Definitely one of the best so far. If you like Italian films, slasher films, or just a slower paced horror film in general, I'd definitely recommend checking this one out. If you did want a Blu-ray, I'm afraid you're out of luck. This is your lot in the UK. I think that there is another DVD release, but honestly, they did such a good job with this one, that if you see this floating around and you're interested, I'd definitely say pick it up. So, excellent film this week on all fronts, which I think is a first. And next week we're going to be taking a look at a film that's been on my radar for a long time now, and I'm looking forward to finally getting to see it. We'll be taking a look at... Toolbox Murders. <laughs>
doesn't really mean much when you look at the films he's directly been a part of. In, the, in 2004 there was a remake directed by Toby Hooper, who you may remember from directing Death Trap, which we covered in episode 7. More commonly known though as Eaten Alive. Not to be confused, of course, with Eaten Alive, which we covered in episode 9. But anyway. Toolbox Murders. It's pretty good. P-O-P -P spells lollipop. <laughs> so the film's quite unconventionally structured. For the first 15 minutes or so, we follow the killer around as he kills women with his toolkit, seemingly at random. He kills four women and then he kidnaps the fifth, and this is where the plot kicks in. We follow the brother of the kidnapped girl around as he tries to figure out where she is. We also follow the cops as they do much of the same. The killer is fantastic. He's revealed about halfway through the film and he's got some great monologues explaining why he's doing what he's doing. He's full of emotion and he comes across as completely insane. And then there's some brutal twists at the end and the last 15 minutes are excellent. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. You hurt my baby. You hurt my cat. My mother was an infidel. You're a heathen. You're a heathen. I'll sit down on you. The Bible says, if one of thy members offend thee, cut it off. This is one hell of a grimy film. Everything's oozing with dirt and sleaze. All the kills are quite naturalistic and not too overplayed. And it's very dark. Can make it a little difficult to see what's happening now and then. But if anything, it just adds to this uncomfortable atmosphere. It kind of reminded me of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The acting's not too bad either. Uh, there's the odd line here and there that's a bit weird. But outside of that, it's fine. And the music is fantastic. A lot of it's diegetic and it uses a lot of country music which kind of adds this weird juxtaposition in some of the more brutal scenes. And I absolutely love that every now and then the killer will hum along to the music, just making him even more sinister. Think fast! <laughs> Thanks. So this is one of the infamously banned video nasty films which The Case loves to bang on about. But honestly, outside of a couple of brutal killings, it's a pretty tame film and you see a hell of a lot worse on TV nowadays. It, if it was released nowadays it'd probably pass with a 15 certificate. I guess it just feels a lot worse than it is because of the quality of the film. Also it says at the end that this is based on true events but I've looked this up and I can't really see anything about it. So if it is, it's very loose. This isn't amazing, it's weirdly stretched and quite blurry and can get really dark at points, but it kind of adds to the grimy aesthetic really. The music quality is fine, which is great because the soundtrack's great. And we get nothing new on the disc, we barely get anything on the disc. Chapter select, a gallery, and a few repeated trailers. And let's have a look at the case. It's pretty good, sells the film well, and of course bangs on a lot about how this film was banned. Now I've had to censor one of the images, I mean I could probably get away with showing it, but it is extremely close to nudity so best not to it. 
The title just says Toolbox Murders, but this film should be The Toolbox Murders. Just Toolbox Murders is the name of the remake. Guess it's just there to confuse people, eh? We get no logo at the beginning this time, just a warning and then straight into the cheap looking menu. Overall then, this was a great watch, a lot of fun and a must see for fans of Texas Chainsaw. Although I would avoid it if you're a little squeamish around things like violence and rape. If you're looking for the upgrade, 88 films have got you covered with a Blu-ray, and in this instance, I probably recommend it. Um, oh, I do have the receipt for the film here. Uh, 50p from CEX. Honestly, if you saw this for 50p, it's probably worth grabbing. Although, <laughs> Four pound for spookies. That is, <laughs> that is not worth that. Don't spend four pound on spookies. You'll regret spending four pound on spookies. <laughs> um, anyway, good film this week, and um, let's hope we can keep it up next week. I think we've got another anthology film next week. We've not had one of them since the very first episode, so looking forward to this one. So we're going to be checking out Vault of Horror on Screen Time. I wonder if there's a film called Scream Time on the Vipka Vault of Horror collection. Alright, so we've got another British anthology film from Roy Ward Baker this week. We're taking a look at Vault of Horrors. So it was made in 1973 and is the second film to be based off of the Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horrors comic book series. The first one being Tales from the Crypt and this is sometimes referred to as Tales from the Crypt 2. Uh, it stars Tom Baker of Doctor Who fame and Terry Thomas and Kurt Jurgens who have just been in a bunch of stuff. It's very comparable to the other Roy Ward Baker film we've covered in episode 2, Asylum. Uh, this one though having five short films, as opposed to, I think there was only three or four in Asylum. Five short films and one film that acts as the sort of through line film. Uh, with the main plot being about five dudes who end up in, trapped in this weird vault somewhere and they recount the recurring nightmares to each other. And then we get a bit of a predictable but well made twist ending. Why not make the best of it? Good idea. Well, let's do that. <laughs> You're a stranger in town, aren't you? <gasps> Sorry if I gave you a fright. The acting's pretty decent, everyone's fine, there aren't really any standout performances, but everyone does the job fine really. Uh, the film has got a fantastic feel to it, it's really comfy and cosy, and the sets have got a nice warm inviting feeling with nice soft lighting. Even the more like horror themed sets, like the graveyards and stuff, they come across as having more of a Halloween vibe than anything terrifying. So there are five films. Out of the five, I'd say only one of them bored me. Out of the four good ones, two of them are focused a bit more on humour, I guess, and the other two are focused more on atmosphere and suspense. And the mixture's great, really gives the film a good pace. Uh, if you're here for gore, you're in the wrong place. This is definitely more of an atmospheric horror film. Uh, I was hoping it'd get as weird as Asylum gets, but it never quite reaches that height. Luckily though, the film still manages to create some fun little stories. See? And now for the print. It's fine really, it's a little blurry, we get the odd pop here and there and a few interlacing issues, 
but it's watchable for what it is and the softer sort of aesthetic kind of adds to this sort of film. And on the disc, nothing new again. Galleries, filmographies, three repeated trailers. Instead of chapter select though, we get story select, so you can pick whichever short film you want and just watch that one, which is quite a nice addition. A little aside, we've reached a little milestone here, for those who've noticed. The uh, first 19 films in the Vipco Scream Time collection are in alphabetical order. I've not said anything until now just to see if anybody did notice. Um, and we've come to the end of that with Vault of Horror. This is the last one in the alphabetical section. Now my theory is that these first 19 films were like the first run. Like they put out these 19, see how they sold. And obviously they sold well enough that they carried on printing them. So if that is the case, if that is the initial run, then I'm fascinated to see if there's any changes in these next upcoming films. We might finally get some different trailers, different special features. There might be the odd quirk that we've not come across yet. Very interested to see what, we're gonna, what we've got coming up. Um, another little thing as well, I guess, the alphabetical section begins and ends with a Roy Ward Baker film, with the last one also being where the other Vipco collection, the Vault of Horror collection, gets its name from. So that's a nice little thing, and it seems very intentional. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming up. And let's take a look at this case. It's pretty good. There is one big issue though. Tom Baker plays an artist in this film, and the back of the case gets his character wrong. It instead thinks that he's the dude with the vampires at the beginning. Bit of an oversight. I mean, I even even bloody watched Doctor Who and I still know who Tom Baker is. Outside of that though, everything else is fine and the runtime is correct to the second. The Vault of Horrors logo is back. Seems quite fitting for this, even though it's still incorrect. Overall then, I really liked this one. It was cosy and it was fun and it'd be great to pop on around Halloween. If you checked out Asylum and you liked that, or if you're a fan of things like Creepshow, then I'd definitely say give this one a go. If you're looking for the upgrade, then there's a couple options out there by, or by Final Cut, I think. Uh, there's the, just the Blu-ray of this on its own, and there's also a double feature Blu-ray with Tales from the Crypt. So, a lot of fun this week, and I think that that's going to get passed on to next week's film, as we break away from our alphabetical shackles and venture forth into what the fuck ever territory. Because we're going to be checking out The Incredible Melting Man. Incredible. So, I've just checked out the incredibly titled The Incredible Melting Man. And I know what you're all wondering, was it incredible? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but it was pretty good. So, it's a 1977 American sci-fi body horror film directed by William Sachs. Now, he was a big fan of surrealism and comedy, and he wanted this film to have those two elements in it but the producers got a hold of it and re-edited it to have a more serious tone. Which, if you ask me, was a terrible idea. I mean, it's about a dude who melts. That concept should not be done seriously. The plot's pretty straightforward really, uh, a mission to space goes wrong and the last surviving astronaut comes back to Earth as a melting radioactive cannibal who goes around eating people for strength. And we follow a doctor and a general as they try and find him and stop him. Bit of a weird set, not gonna lie. So this film has got one really good element and one really bad element. I'll start with the good, the effects are excellent. 
mainly the mountain. There, we don't really get much outside of the mountain, but the mountain's enough to stand on its own and it really steals the show. Uh, the effects are done by a dude called Rick Baker, who did the special effects for An American Werewolf in London. So you know it's going to be good, and he, he's really good in this. Uh, now for the bad. The pacing is kind of all over the place here. Uh, the film kind of meanders from kill to kill, with very little happening in between. Now, this probably came about as uh, a side effect of the re-edit, the change from it being a comedy to a serious film. And it's a shame, really. Houston calling Scorpio 5. Steve, do you read me? When it's entertaining, it can be really fun though. There are lots of comic relief characters to help move the story along, such as the lemon-stealing elderly couple and the trigger-happy cops who are just giggling while shooting at the end. And all the acting's that fun, silly, campy acting that I just love. Now, a lot of the kills are actually done off-screen, which is a bit of a shame, but the kills that we do get to see are fantastic, such as the dude falling onto the electrical cables and exploding, and of course, the big finale, the big melt, which is masterfully done. Besides lemons, it'd be better. I can make you a nice lemon meringue pie. Would you like that, darling? All right. Go steal your lemons. No, Neil! No! <laughs> So how does Vipco decide to treat this film? Terribly. The print is awful. It's muddy, it's blurry, and there's massive flickers now and again. This film relies heavily on its special effects, and when you can barely see what the hell's happening because of a shitty print, it kinda ruins the whole thing. And do we get anything new on the disc? Now that we're out of the alphabetical section? No. No we don't. But we do get everything. We get chapter select stills, filmographies, and all four of the repeated trailers. Kind of a disappointment, but what can you do, eh? And the case isn't much better. It reads pretty well to start off with, but then you notice things like here, where they say that there's six things the mountain man needs, and then proceed to list five. And they also spelt werewolf wrong here. Seems a little stupid. Outside of that though, the info is correct. Uh, we get the Vault of Horrors logo again, no change there either, and again, I'm not going to mention this again until it changes in some way. Overall then, this is one hell of a weird film, and for that alone I would recommend it. Sure, it's a little slow, and it gets a little lost now and again, but the special effects, the funny scenes, and just the absurdity of the whole thing more than make up for it. I wouldn't recommend this print though. The, the Vipco release of this is awful. Uh, go get yourself the Blu-ray, Arrow have got you covered on that front, and it'll be miles better than this, I'm sure. So, one crazy film this week, and I think that is gonna get passed over onto the next film that we watch. Because we're gonna be taking a look at Ruggiero Diodato's the House at the Edge of the Park. I had to look up how to pronounce Ruggiero Diodato, because I've always just called him Ruggero. Also, it's in a red case for some reason. Oh, 
all right. So, we've got a real short one this week. Coming in at just 76 minutes, we're taking a look at the house on the edge of the park. And it was pretty good, apart from one massive issue, but we'll talk about that more later on. So it's a 1980 Italian exploitation film, directed by Ruggiero Diodato, who was probably best known for directing the infamous Cannibal Holocaust. And the film stars Giovanni Radisi, who we've seen twice already. He was in uh, City of the Living Dead, which we covered in episode 5, and he was also in Stage Fright, which we covered in episode 18, I believe. And the film also stars David Hess, who is very well known for being in Wes Craven's The Last House on the Left. Which, funnily enough, this film heavily inspired this one. Get ready for some sleaze, it's exploitation time. I went and changed. You said I could come along tonight. And that's got. Are we gonna boogie? That too. <laughs> <laughs> the plot revolves around two insane car repairmen who tag along to a party hosted by some rich people in exchange for them getting their car fixed up. Once there, the two repairmen act out their depraved power fantasies, but there's a greater twist to the whole evening. I actually really like this one. It's dark, it's tense, and even though there are quite a few uncomfortable scenes peppered throughout, these are punctuated by either some ridiculous or some actually well done acting. A lot of the guests are terrible, I swear their only job was to spout bad dialogue. But on the flip side, the killers are really good and they really steal the show, especially David Hess. <laughs> Why that look? What's so funny? You. You got a lot of balls. To have balls, my dear, you have to have them first up there and then down there. The film's shot really well. It gets right up close and personal and really makes for some uncomfortable scenes. There's this great bit where the camera's tracking behind one of the guests who's managed to escape and it really adds to the tension because it puts you right there behind her in the scene. The twist ending's pretty good as well. I did have my suspicions that it was going to end the way that it did, but it manages to pull it off really well where it feels natural to the story. Also the music's fantastic too. It's done by Riz Ortolini, if that's how you pronounce his name, who's famous for doing the Cannibal Holocaust soundtrack. Now this soundtrack isn't as good as this one, but it's still pretty damn good. <laughs> So what's the big problem with this film then? I mean, so far it comes across as quite a well-made exploitation film. Could it be the print? No, no. Both the audio and the visual are very clear and well done, and in fact, I'd go so far as to say that this is an excellent example of a Vipco release. Could it be what's on the disc then, special features? No, again, no, I mean we get nothing new here, but we get everything that we expect to get. We get all four repeated trailers, chapter select stills and filmographers. Now, the big issue with this film is the cut. Now, this is a notorious video nasty that's been banned and cut over the years. And this version, fucking BBFC got their hands on this one in a big bad way because this is missing nearly 12 minutes of footage which I think is absolutely ridiculous, and it explains why the runtime is so short. Now apparently, a lot of the stuff that got cut out was the sleaziest stuff, you know, the rape scenes and the violence. And luckily, this film is engaging enough to survive the chopping block. But honestly, I would much rather see this film in its intended form, rather than this butchered mess. 
fucking BBFC, man. Now, let's take a look at this weird case. They went a little overboard with the description, and it reads clunky with strange short sentences. It feels like it was trying to be funny, maybe. Not sure. Also, it gets a few bits wrong here and there, such as here where it says Alex refuses the $50 a day offer. Now, they only offer him $40, and it's not for the day, it's just for a quick fix. And then here, a pistol found by chance. That's not how it plays out in the film. And then it just completely gives away the ending. Also, we get this cropped poster image. No screenshots from the film or anything like that. It's just a bit of a shit one this time. Overall, then, I really enjoyed this one. It's got entertaining acting, uncomfortable scenes, and just everything that you'd want from an exploitation film, really. It's not for the faint-hearted, but if you feel like you can hack it and you're a fan of things like Last House on the Left, I'd definitely say give this one a go. But not this release. Not this cut. It is far too heavily cut down from what it was intended to be. And the cuts are really obvious at that. Now Shameless have put out another DVD, and this one is still cut, but only by two minutes, so it's better than this, but in my opinion, still not good enough. If you want a fully uncut version, I'm afraid you're going to have to import. So, a great film, fucked over by the BBFC this week. Hopefully next week we get something a little better. So we're going to be taking a look at Umberto Lenzi's Ghost House. Time to get spooky this week, because we're taking a look at Ghost House. Also known as La Casa 3, it's a 1988 Italian supernatural horror film directed by Umberto Lenzi, who you might remember for directing Eaten Alive from episode 9. It stars one of my all-time favourites, Donald O'Brien, who is best known for playing Dr. Obrero in The Incredible Zombie Holocaust, which we covered in the Dead of Night collection. I'll put a link to that there or something. So it was made to cash in on the Evil Dead films, and it did pretty well in its own country, and a sequel was spawned a couple years later, starring Linda Blair from The Exorcist. It's trashy, and it's stupid, and it's my kind of film. The plot follows a guy who hears a distressing message on his ham radio, so he and his girlfriend set out to see what's what. Along the way they bump into some youngsters who were camping outside this big house, and surprise surprise, the house turns out to be haunted. It really throws a lot at you from the get-go. A haunted house, possessed clown doll, a crazy killer, weird singing and chanting, and a hell of a lot of strange dialogue. Sadly, none of these things are really fleshed out, but we get some great scenes along the way. The dialogue is really fascinating. It's sort of dreamlike and disjointed, but definitely not intentionally so. Okay, so it was my voice. And the scream sounded like my sister Tina. It doesn't make any sense though. I swear, I don't get it. I don't know. Then I heard that song. That stupid song. Was it like a children's nursery rhyme? Then you believe me? Oh, sure I believe you, of course. Oh, thank goodness. Everyone thinks I lie all the time, but I don't. I know. Now try and close your eyes and get some sleep, okay? Okay. Maybe there's something supernatural about all this, guys. I don't know. All I know are computers. <laughs> The acting generally falls into the entertainingly bad category, which is great. It makes the characters a lot more fun to watch. 
The practical effects, the camper, yet really well made. I'm liking things like the glass ballooning out and exploding, and the mirrors all warping. You can tell a lot of work went into it, and it really paid off. It makes for some really memorable scenes. I'm really digging the creepy clown as well, getting some real poltergeist vibes from it. And the music's great as well, some rocking 80s synth. weird bits for this film, outside of the writing and acting. Firstly, the film takes place for the most part in broad daylight, probably the sunniest day with like bright blue skies, which seems kind of counterintuitive when you're making a haunted house film. And tying into this, a lot of the film takes place away from the house, which is a massive shame because a lot of the best scenes are in the house. It could definitely have done with a few more haunting scenes, and it just kind of seems like a big missed opportunity. This might be one of the best prints we've had so far. It's clear, with no grain or scratches, an excellent example of a Vipco film. Maybe they're finally getting the hang of things. And on the disc, we get nothing new, but we do get everything again. At least they're consistently giving us everything. Now, this is one strange case. Firstly, it's laid out in columns like a newspaper. If that isn't weird enough, it's all very opinion based, saying that it's hugely enjoyable for Vipco fans, and describing one of the characters as having a face like a slapped arse, which just seems pretty mean really, and it's mad that this was printed on the back of a film. We also get a few errors, two examples of no spaces after a full stop, here and here. I do like the screenshots that they've used, but it just doesn't make up for how weirdly this whole thing reads. Such a strange, strange case. Overall then, I liked this one. It's not a perfect film, but I really enjoyed my time with it, and I'd say that it was better than the other Umberto Lenzi film that we've watched. There's a hell of a lot going on, and I'd definitely recommend it. I'd say it might be quite fun to watch with a group of friends. I'd even recommend this print. It was pretty damn good. And it's a good job, really, because outside of this, there's nothing really in the UK. If you want a Blu-ray or an upgrade, you're going to have to import, I'm afraid. So, decent one this week, and next week we're moving from ghosts to vampires. So we're going to be taking a look at... Grave of the Vampire. This week is Grave of the Vampires. How exciting. So it's an American horror film from 1972, directed by John Hayes, not John Hughes like I keep nearly bloody saying, who has done nothing that I've ever heard of. And it stars William Smith from Maniac Cop and Michael Pataki from Halloween 4. And I'm gonna warn you now, this is not a great film. The story starts with a woman getting raped and impregnated by a vampire. She keeps the baby, and years later the baby, now a man, sets out to seek revenge and murder his vampire father, who is now a teacher at a night school, because he's a vampire. This is a very boring film, 
It's all talk and very little action. The gore is minimal, as are the practical effects, and the pacing, which is the biggest problem, is trying to be slow and atmospheric, but it just comes across as dull because it never really focuses on anything interesting. Also, the plot beats are very obvious, and it just kind of ruins any engagement you've got with the film, adding to the overall boredom. There are a couple of interesting bits now and again. I quite like the fight at the end, and the old man vampire hobbling about at the beginning had me chuckling. And there's the odd bit of naff acting and weird line. But outside of that, the whole film just kind of felt soulless and bland. A little bit like a vampire, really. That's all I've got to say on this film. The real star of the show, the real thing to talk about, has got to be the print. Oh, oh my god. So you remember last week we had the best print that we have had in the entire collection so far. And at the end I said, oh, maybe they're getting the hang of things now. Well, I was wrong. This is the worst print that we have had yet. It's even worse than Drive-In Massacre, if you can believe it. It is absolutely abysmal. It's flickery and really, really grainy all the way throughout. The colours are off, there's ghosting and interlacing issues, uh, the darks all blur into one, and worst of all, it skips, meaning that partway through a scene, it'll just jump, cutting out a big part of the dialogue, which was hard enough to understand in the first place. Just an absolutely abysmal print and I think it might have massively hindered my enjoyment of the film. You remember earlier when I said that the slow and atmospheric shots don't really focus on anything interesting? Well, they might have been focusing on something interesting, but I just couldn't make out what the hell was happening. Here's some examples. Mine is not the reason, mine is just to do or not. And let's take a look at the case. Seems fine, really. Really bigs the film up and all the info's correct. Much better job than the print. And on the disc, we get nothing new. Same old stuff, but once again, we do get everything. Overall, then, I found this to be a dull and forgettable sip. Did get a couple of laughs, but that's about it. And what made the whole thing a hell of a lot worse was the terrible print. It was barely watchable and it looks like they found the negatives in the bin. If for some reason you are interested in checking this out and you want the upgrade, then I'm afraid you're out of luck for the UK unless you're willing to import. Now, there is a version on Amazon Prime, and I thought, ooh, I wonder if it's a different better print, maybe the print for the American Blu-ray. No, it's not, no. It looks like it's the same print as this, but slightly worse. It's in 4x3 and it's really blurry on top of everything else that's wrong with it. So if I were you, I'd just completely avoid this one. So, a load of rubbish this week. And next week... <laughs> next week... We're gonna be checking out... The Nostril Picker. Send help. All right, here we go then. The Nostril Picker. What the hell is this 76 minute long film really all about? We'll start with some background information. 
So it's a 1993 American horror film from Michigan, directed by Mark Nowicki. Not by Patrick J. Matthews, which the case will try and have you believe for some reason. So we follow a pervert who gains magical abilities from a homeless man. He can now change forms when he hums London Bridges Falling Down. He does this to change into a young teenage girl so he can perv on other teenage girls and eventually kill them. But he's being followed and tracked by a discount Dr. Loomis. This is one weird set. Oh, what's your name? Joe. Uh, Josephine. <laughs> well, you know, everybody calls me Joe. I don't like the man's name just without the E. Oh. He's got cash? If you got the gas. So this film has got a lot of issues. While certain bits are entertaining, they're more just entertaining in how bizarre they are, most of the film is just really boring, and it just boils down to long static shots of people talking in various rooms. It also tries its hand at being funny, but down to bad acting and some really dated humour, it just falls flat on its face. The acting is never hilariously bad, it always just falls into that uninteresting or wooden category, just adding to the boredom, and there are a bunch of missed opportunities here as well. A running joke that it really likes to overuse is the shot of all the girls hanging out with this creepy dude tagging along, and that works in some instances, but because of how inappropriately the main character can act, it would have been really funny seeing him in the girl form acting inappropriately. And honestly, we barely see her throughout most of the film. Just seems like a bit of a shame. The gore, while minimal, is actually really well made. I especially liked the twitching finger nubs. I thought that was really effective. Overall though, the kills are few and we don't really see all that much. That's the same as the other one. Victim was sliced up pretty good with a large knife. And the bite marks are human. Looks like the same guy. And judging by the depth of the wound on her neck, I'd say the victim died almost instantly. You went home with a teenage girl. Once at her place, she turned into a middle-aged man and he tried to kill you. Is that right? More or less. There's a couple of things I wanted to mention about this film. Firstly, I have seen it before. I watched it back in 2012 with a mate of mine while we were at uni. And there's the, there was this one scene that we just could not believe when it came on. It's the montage at the school where the song I'm Gonna Get Me Some Schooling kicks in. It's so upbeat and it feels so out of place and weird that we just could not believe what we were seeing. And I go so far as to say it's a good scene because it stuck with us and we still quote it to this day. Secondly, the film is called The Nostril Picker. And it says on the back of the box, he picks his nose, he turns into a girl. That isn't necessarily true. He does pick his nose once or twice, but it has no magical effect on him. It's not even a character defining trait of his, he just happens to do it in one or two scenes. So why the hell is it called The Nostril Picker? And thirdly, this film really likes to wear its influences on its sleeve. Here's a couple that I noticed. It just blatantly mentions Siskel and Ebert. There's a house on Elm Street, and the family in the house are the Manson family. And the most obvious one, the main character, is called Joe Bukowski. So, I'd rather be reading some Bukowski than watching this. School Prim, once again, is horrendous. It's not as bad as last week's, there's no flickering and grain, but it is extremely blurry and there's a lot of ghosting issues and interlacing issues and the colours are way off. And the sound is really bad this week as well. It's really low quality and it keeps ducking in and out and makes it 
really difficult to understand what anyone is saying. This is definitely one of the worst prints we've seen so far. And on the disc, we get nothing new. We only get two repeated trailers this week, Chapter Select and Stills. We don't get filmographies because everyone who worked on this has done nothing else. And let's take a look at this case. This is by far the shortest bit of information we've had on the back of one of these. It reads more like a tagline than an actual description. I guess they had nothing to say about it really. It definitely implies that he picks his nose to change into a girl with this. Maybe they should have added in, he hummed London Bridge, just to make it a bit clearer. And I can't believe they got the director wrong too. Uh, this Patrick J. Matthews, from what I gather, was the director of photography and the producer. And the film was actually directed by this Mark Nowicki, who they've put as a producer here. Just seems like a really stupid mistake. And we've actually got some logo update here for once. Um, there is no logo on the beginning of this, it just jumps straight to the menu. It's been a while since that's changed. Overall then, this was not a great film. It was weird and sleazy, and even though a few bits were interesting, there was not enough of them to make me ever want to recommend this to anyone. And at 76 minutes long, it really dragged. If for some reason you are interested and you wanted an upgrade, I'm afraid you're completely out of luck. There is no other release outside of this one, and this is definitely not worth your time. So, rubbish film, and... You know what? I'm gonna call it there. I think it's time for me to have a break. So far, I've covered 24 films of the Scream Time collection, and when I return, I'll be doing the last 21 films. It's been great so far, I've really enjoyed doing this series, and it's been fascinating seeing the ups and downs of the series. There's been some fantastic films that I'm so glad I got a chance to watch. And there's been some awful films that sitting through and having to criti critically look at these films and make notes was an absolute slog. But I'll never forget doing it. Uh, a couple films that stood out to me. Uh, for the good, I definitely recommend City of the Living Dead, Toolbox Murders and Stage Fright. Those were great, I really enjoyed all three of those. If you can get nice Blu-rays of them, definitely do that. Um, but I'd recommend those ones. And I would avoid, at all costs, Grave of the Vampire, The Slayer, and Drive-In Massacre. <sighs> those were terrible films. I think Drive-In Massacre might be the worst one I've seen so far. Worst print was definitely Grave of the Vampire. That one wins worst print, but Drive-In Massacre was just a slog to sit through. Uh, it's interesting as well now, looking at these, a lot of these films have been re-released elsewhere, so it kind of feels like collecting Vipco might seem redundant to a lot of people nowadays. And that's completely understandable, that makes a lot of sense. For me, it's completely a nostalgia reason that I've got these, uh, buying them from markets as a teenager and that sort of thing. I just wanted to see what they had to offer and it's quite interesting having them all and being able to see how good a release company it can be and how awful it can be. When I return as well I really hope that we get some new special features. It seems like they've just been really boring the special features and really repeated these past these past like 10-15 films. Really dull. I, do you remember when we used to get like, we had interviews on some of them, I think it was Island of Death, we had an uh, interview with the director and stuff like that. We need more of that I think in these, and even more anomalies, like remember in the Asylum episode when there was a, tra a trailer for Tim? Maybe I'll check Tim out in my time off, I'll tell you what that one's all about, I know. Like why is that a trailer in this? It has nothing to do with this series at all, it just, it baffles me, it really does baffle me. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun, and thank you for watching, and thank you to the patrons as well, they've really helped me make this series, couldn't have done it without you. And I'll be back in October 2021, where I'll be looking at the second half of the Vipco Scream Time collection, so I'll see you then.
I'm back, had a nice little break, feeling well rested, well, I was when I wrote the script for this anyway, and I'm ready to crack on with part two of the Vipco Scream Time Reviews. For those of you that might not be aware, I've been going through the entire Vipco Scream Time collection and reviewing each film in it. If you've not seen any of the previous reviews, I'd recommend checking those out before starting on this video. Uh, I put up recently a complete part one video, so that might be worth your time because I am going to be making reference to the collection as a whole throughout these videos. So nothing's really happened in my time off, so let's just begin. And we have got a hell of a film to start on. This is a weird one. We've not had anything like this in the collection so far, and that might be for the best. Suicide is the name of the film. Very blunt and to the point, and I'm sure YouTube is going to hate that. But it's better than his alternate title, which is um, FinalCut.com, which I'm pretty sure if you type that into Google, just comes up with the website for the video editing software. So it's a 2001 German found footage horror film directed by a fella called Raoul Heimrich who has pretty much only done German TV shows outside of this. So the plot revolves around a couple who are filming suicides, and one of them likes it a little too much. And that's about as far as you get with the plot. It's a film that knows exactly what it wants to do, but it never quite reaches what it's aiming for. Or maybe that's giving it a little too much credit. <laughs> The film's kind of split up into each of the suicides, which follow quite a formulaic pattern, which will be some sort of monologue from the suicide then the act, then afterwards cutting back to the car where the directors are and just seeing them sort of whinge about the film they're making for a little bit. It gets very repetitive, very quickly, and it's not helped by the fact that there are far too many suicides in this film called Suicide. Sometimes the monologues can be alright, the acting can be okay, maybe the topic's quite interesting, but for the most part, you're going to get long, drawn out, boring shots of nothing really, while people just sort of mope about and not really say anything. It gets old very fast. And what makes it all worse is the lack of a plot, because there's no through line to latch onto. It makes it just for a very shallow experience. And the little plot that we do get is very predictable. It could funktionieren, glaube ich. Aber wie soll man das nicht kommen? So eine Frage noch beschaffen. Und dann... I was actually quite excited about watching this one. Something about it made me think that it was going to be really gruesome and have quite a lot of like, gore effects. But I was very wrong. It falls into a trap that a lot of other low-budget gore films fall into, and that's having the camera see a person, we turn away, we cut back, the person's dead. We don't actually see a lot of the gore happening. And it's also got a lot of terrible early 2000s CG effects in it, which I will definitely be showing in the footage coming up. One thing that it does do pretty well, though, is injections. Uh, there's quite a few death by various injection, like air injection, poison injection, heroin injection, stuff like that, and it does look pretty good, honestly. Especially the penis injection scene, which kind of just comes out of nowhere, and because of that, it's kind of a highlight of the film. But obviously, I can't show you that here. I wanted to mention three oddities with this film that I thought were worth bringing to light. Firstly, 
This is the first and only film, I believe, in the entire collection that is in a foreign language. So, it's got subtitles. I think it might be the only film actually with subtitles as well. And they're not great. The hard coded, which isn't that good for a start because it means you can't toggle them on and off or anything like that. But there's a lot of grammar errors, spelling errors, and just some really weird phrasing. So they're just not great. Secondly, out of all the suicides, most of the men have monologues and none of the women speak. They just mope it about and kill themselves. Don't know what that's about, just seems weird. And thirdly, you might be wondering why I've got three copies of this film. So am I. No, the, uh, the reason that I have three copies is because the first two that I bought, for some reason, they both got really badly printed out sleeves. Something must keep happening to this film's cover, where people need to reprint the sleeves out. The discs, the discs are legit, as far as I can tell. I mean, they, they look, they look bootleg anyway, but these discs are legit. But they, both the cases are badly printed out, really blurry on the back. So, I had to get three copies until I finally got one that's a legit case. Uh, I think that says more about me than anything though really, doesn't it? Uh, those two will be cropping up in uh, Sheffield CEX in the future. Or, actually, because this is coming out months, months down the line, they might already be there. Maybe they've gone, maybe some idiots bought them. I wouldn't recommend buying them. If you do want them, more for you. I mean, I bought it three times, so I think it says more about me really in the long run. But, hey, go check out CEX, there might be a copy knocking about for you. Unbedingt dieses hübsche Mädchen küssen wolltest. Ich hab sie voll blutend in der Badewanne. Let's take a look at the release. Start with the image quality. Now, this to me looks like a film that was shot on a DV camera, digital video camera, which, for those who don't know, it's kind of that mid ground between. VHS and digital, it's just falls in between there. So it looks like a lot of uh, home movies from the early 2000s. While that is nostalgic, it is pretty naff. It's in 4x3 and there are like lines that appear at the top and the bottom every now and then. It's, it's not the worst, but it's not great either. And let's see what's on the disc. Nothing new again, chapter select, four repeater trailers, and the worst image gallery I have ever seen on any of these discs. It puts the still in like these little circles. What's the point? You can barely see what the still is. And let's have a look at the case. It's all right, I guess. There's a bit of strange phrasing here and there, and there's a grammar error here, but that's about it. No idea why these screenshots are blue though, very strange. Also, we actually get an error on the spine this time. The one foreign language film we get, and they don't even change this section, but yet they thought to mention it on the back. We get the Vault of Horror logo at the beginning again, and once again I'll not mention this unless it changes. Overall, this film is far too dull for its own good, and there are much better examples of this style of film already in existence. So if the premise for this does interest you in some way, I wouldn't recommend this, I would recommend one of these, either The Last Horror Movie or Man Bites Dog. Both of these do that sort of found footagey following a killer around storyline way, way, way better than this one than this one ever did, so watch one of these, don't bother with this. Also, I wouldn't bother with this if you're in any way sensitive to images of suicide. But if you are, I mean, that's pretty much a dead giveaway right there, isn't it? Uh, if you want an upgrade, if for some reason you do want to see this and you want a Blu-ray of it, then you're out of luck. Uh, pretty much only Vipco have released this in the UK, so it's either this one, I think they did one on the Vaults of Horror as well, but I'm guessing it's just identical so 
but don't bother picking it up anyway. It's not very, it's not very good. Um, even if you see my copies in CEX, don't bother, don't bother. So, a very naff way to start this second half. Let's hope things pick up next week, because we're going to be taking a look at the dungeon. So you remember how bad last episode's film was? Well somehow, this one manages to be even worse. So bad in fact that I'd say this is the second worst film of the Vipco collection so far. Driving Massacre still holds that number one spot for me though. The Dungeon, otherwise known as Dr. Jekyll's Dungeon of Death, is a 1979, or 1982 if you believe this disc, American horror film Directed by, produced by, co-written by, and edited by, James Wood. No, not that James Woods, unfortunately. James Wood, singular. Who has only done this and directed two other porn films. And it's co-written and starring a fellow called James Mathers. It's a slow and boring mad scientist film that just feels like a big old waste of time. Ah, the past. Yes. His arrival can only mean that I am finally on the verge of the breakthrough. We follow Dr. Jekyll, who is the great-grandson of THE Dr. Jekyll, the fictional character, and he's made some sort of serum that sends people into a blind rage and is experimenting on people. He's also kidnapped a woman who used to be his assistant and he's got some sort of thing for her, and his old professor is staying around at his, and he turns out to be the father of the girl who's been kidnapped. They just doss about chatting for an hour and a half, some people die, and then the film ends. The film mainly consists of Dr. Jekyll explaining his experiments to the professor, or watching his experiments fight. And now this is where the film gets a little bit weird, because there's a lot of martial arts fights in this film. Uh, I counted five in total, and the film comes to a screeching halt to show you these fight sequences, which do seem like a really strange fit for a film like this. In total, the total runtime of all the fights is 22 minutes, which is a third of the film, and nothing else is happening while these fights are on. Now, I like a good martial arts fight sequence, but they're generally only good to watch when there's stakes, when you know the characters who are involved in the fight and there's a purpose for it. But these are just random experiment people who come in and fight for a bit, and it just makes them a pain to watch. Let's talk about these characters. So his main character is Dr. Jekyll, played by James Mathers and he doesn't shut up throughout the entire film. Now his acting isn't the worst, but with his endless pontificating and scenery chewing, he gets really great in really fast. And then there's the professor. Now this guy is appalling. His acting is by far the worst in the whole film, and he's got a big part, but it's so bad that it's very entertaining to watch. He never changes the inflection in his voice at all, and he's constantly looking either shocked or completely lost. No idea why they hired him, but I'm glad they did. It made it ever so slightly more watchable. And then there's the side characters. Now, there are a lot of side characters in this, but the main one to really mention, I think, is Dr. Jekyll's lobotomized sister, who pops up every now and then with a big wide-eyed, gormless expression, 
and it made me chuckle a few times. Outside of that though, her character is completely pointless, as are most of the side characters in this. Great Scott Jekyll! He was cum lauded Oxford Medical the year you were expelled. My expertise is involved in the behaviour of human beings, not their destruction. So there are two scenes that are mentioned on the back of the case that I feel are worth bringing up here. So firstly, in the hour verdict bit, it keeps banging on about this eye scene. And it is a pretty weird scene. So basically Dr. Jekyll goes a bit crazy, starts stabbing some ice while shouting ice. And while it is amusing, it is nowhere near as entertaining as the back of the case will have you believe. And secondly, there's the scalding water scene, which it does mention here. So I thought it was going to be like a big thing. I was looking forward to maybe some good effects or something like that. But it is pathetic. It basically just boils down, boils down, to um, Dr. Jekyll just dribbling some scalding water on his sister from a kettle. And it's brief. It, you can't really see anything, and then in the next scene, she's back to normal as if nothing happened. Completely pointless. Don't know why they brought it up on the case. Overall, with this film really, anything that's gore or effects related is either terrible or non-existent. I guess they spent all the money on the fight sequences. I said ice, You do know what ice is, don't you? I do. This is ice. Ice! 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 Time to take a look at this print, I think. It's pretty terrible, really. It's in 4x3 aspect ratio, and it's even slightly off-centre in that. It looks like the film was shot on some really mucky film stock, and this copy is also a VHS rip on top, with some pretty big flickers at one point. All the darks blend together and make it look like it was shot in some grey mud, which makes it really dull and unappealing. And let's see what's on the disc. Nothing new again. All four trailers repeated, uh, chapter select, filmographies, which is a minute little section, and another really strange stills section, with a really strange template of Dr. Jekyll pulling a stupid face. Disorientation? Paranoia. And let's check out this case. It really bigs this one up. It even has an hour verdict section saying how much fun it was watching it in a specific cinema. It seems strange and kind of reminds me of the back of Ghost House with all the opinions and such. There's a grammar error, a really weird spelling of enough, not sure if it's a reference to something, I don't know. And loads of quotes from the film for seemingly no reason. Just overall, a very weird blurb. But the info is all correct outside of the hyperbole. Overall then, this was a slog to sit through. I was checking out by the 40 minute mark, and those fight scenes just killed any pacing that this film could have had. If you want a good mad scientist film with some amazing effects and a really fun plot, then just check out the reanimator instead. If for some reason you do want to see this and you want a Blu-ray of it, then I'm afraid you're out of luck. This is your lot for the UK. So, we're not doing very well this half, are we really? Two films down and both of them have been appalling. But I know for a fact that that's going to change next week, because we're checking out one of my favourite zombie films of all time. The Zombie Dead. And it's redundant title. <laughs>
I have been dying to talk about this one. I think this is the fourth time I've seen it. This is the one I've seen the most out of the whole collection. And it does not get old. So let's take a look. Also, this case seems to have got like a, a plastic hair. How strange. No, no! Stand back! I'm your friend! No! A joke. No, no, it isn't, James. Oh. The plot revolves around a group of couples who turn up at a place, like a mansion, big house thing, to see a professor who is trying to raise the dead. But the professor's missing, and the dead are all knocking about, eating whoever they can. This film wastes no time on plot though, and it just jumps right in with the zombies. I think we see his first zombie only three minutes into the film, and we don't stop seeing him until one minute before the end. It's just jam-packed with gore, zombies, chase scenes, and loads of bizarre character moments, all nicely packaged into 80 minutes. This film has one of the most eclectic group of zombies I think I have ever seen. Some of them range from looking like they're wearing a badly painted Halloween mask, to having really deformed faces that like they're made out of clay, and some have even got live maggots and worms crawling around on them. They amble about, they're completely silent, and there are loads of them. These are definitely some of the best zombies I have ever seen in one of these low budget Italian films. And the gore's top notch as well, it ranges from passable to pretty impressive and there's loads of it as well. It's a lot of fun and really well done. The acting and dubbing are perfectly terrible, the sort of stuff that will have you giggling all the way throughout. Now there's one character that I really want to mention here, for people who've seen this film you probably know who I'm going to be talking about, and that's the boy, Michael. So there are a few couples, and one of the couples has got a kid, and he is meant to be a little kid, talks to his mother like a toddler and stuff like that, but he's played by a 25 year old man and not meaning to be rude to the actor or anything, but he is creepy as hell. And that's not helped by the little bit of plot that he's got with bits of incest in there. Really not helping matters. But whenever he's on screen, he steals the show completely. And I'd say to a point where this film is worth watching for him alone. And he contributes to the ending sequence, which is both bizarre and hilarious, but don't worry. I won't spoil that for you here. Mama. What is it, Michael? Let's have a quick look at this print. It's alright. The film stock that it was shot on looks a little bit mucky, but it's passable. There are a couple of flickers in there, but nothing major. And the sound quality is pretty good too, which is good, because the music's alright. And on the disc, we get nothing new. Same old stuff. You know what's on the disc. And the case is fine. The font is pretty awful, you can barely make out what it's trying to say, but this probably isn't helped by the fact that it's got a really pixelated image in the background and no screenshots, 
strange. There's a spelling error here, I forgot to pluralise guests, but that's about it. All the info's fine, really. There's also a quote on the back, which, yeah, I'd agree with that. Overall, then, I would say that this is the perfect example of a so bad it's good Italian zombie movie, and it is definitely not the last time that I'll be sitting down to watch this. If you're in the market for a zombie film with some decent effects and far too many zombies to count, or you just fancy something daft to pop on when some mates are around and you can have a laugh at it, I would highly recommend this one. This release is fine, especially if you can find it for cheap, but if you did want an upgrade, 88 Films have got you covered with a Blu-ray, they call theirs Burial Ground. So, this is absolutely one of the best of the collection so far. Let's hope we can carry it on next week with another decent film. We're carrying on with the same theme, another zombie film, and one that I've been dying to watch for quite some time. We're going to be checking out Lucio Fulci's Zombie Flesh Eaters 2, which I also have on VHS. So we're carrying on the zombie trend this episode, because I've just checked out Zombie Flesh Eaters 2. More commonly known as Zombie 3 in the States, it's a 1988 Italian zombie horror film directed by everyone's favourite Lucio Fulci. We've covered a bunch of his films in this series so far. But it's also co-directed by Bruno Mattai, who you may remember from directing episode 15's film, Rats. So it's got a bit of a strange history, this series. It's a bit of a complicated series. Clearly, it's a sequel to uh, Lucio Fulci's previous film, Zombie Flesh Eaters, which I covered in the Dead of Night collection. Uh, there'll be a link to the review up on the screen there. But this is an unofficial sequel to the Dario Argento cut of Giorgio Romero's Dawn of the Dead. So it's a little complicated and it, it's called the zombie series in America and I think maybe even in Italy as well with this commonly being known as Zombie 2 and this one as Zombie 3. It's also got quite a uh, troubled production history by the sounds of it with Lucio Fulci leaving partway through because he couldn't stand the film and um, Bruno Mattai being swept in afterwards to pick up the slack and you can really tell. This is also the only Vipco film that I own on VHS. Yes, yes, get after that man. Get in the helicopter, after him. All of you, we mustn't get away for Christ's sake. <laughs> hey guys, this Blue Arts music's great, huh? Yeah, making me horny. <laughs> Let's start with the plot. It's pretty bare bones, really. A virus is stolen from a lab and the container that it's in breaks and the virus is unleashed, which leaves the army and the scientists arguing about how to sort it all out. Meanwhile, some teenagers and some soldiers are caught in the middle of zombies and the army, who are both trying to kill them. It lacks a lot in its characters, with most of them boiling down to either zombie fodder or bland action heroes. It makes it really difficult to latch on to anyone. And by the end, I was really surprised at who managed to survive, because they all felt disposable. I don't like it here. Okay, but let's not make a big deal out of it. I like smoking. I take a toke on a joint every now and then, and once in a while I like to piss on a bush. The dubbing ranges from passable to hilariously bad, and I specifically want to point out the main scientist guy here for this. I think it's something to do with his original Italian characterization, but he pauses quite a lot, and then the voice actor has to also add these pauses in, and it comes across as pretty unnatural and quite funny. You get some decent gore effects, they're okay, and there's some fun zombie parts in here as well. Unfortunately, a lot of the action is taken up with gunfights. 
and I always think that it makes it far too dull. It's a bit too much power against something as clumsy and as slow as a zombie. It takes away any sort of threat that this film might have and it definitely makes it feel a lot less like a Fulci film. things that I thought were worth mentioning, just bullet points more than anything really. Uh, firstly, the zombies talk, which I always find really strange. Used to them just grunting and such. But they sound a lot like the Deadites in The Evil Dead. I don't know, maybe they're using a similar voice filter or something like that. Secondly, there's a big chunk towards the beginning of the film where it basically just turns into Hitchcock's The Birds. It's a fun sequence with lots of zombie birds flying about and attacking people, but it doesn't really fit with the last hour and ten minutes of the film. It just sort of seems out of place. Thirdly, this film also reminded me of Return of the Living Dead. One for the talking zombies, yeah, but also because there's a big plot point that's very similar to this, uh, being that if you burn the dead that have been infected, their ashes will fly up into the air as smoke, and then it'll turn into rain and rain down on people and more people will get infected due to the rainfall. I'd recommend this one over Flesh Eaters 2 though. Um, that Return of the Living Dead is a lot of fun and really good and really worth checking out. One to watch, definitely. And finally, the best part of the film is the flying zombie head. And Fulshi agrees with me on this one. <laughs> Take a look at this release then. It's not very good. It's not very good. The print is okay, so it's a 16 by 9 film that's been rendered out into a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so from widescreen to full screen. So you've got hard coded in black bars, top and bottom. This has then been ran through on a 16 by 9 TV, which thinks the film's playing at a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. So then you've got the black bars at the side as well. So you're watching a film in a box, in a box, and it kind of ruins it a little bit. Also, the quality is just not very good either. It's pixelated, it's washed out, and it's very dirty. It's a very dirty film grain that they're using. Massive shame, because there are points in this film, and both Fulci and Bruno Mattei have proven that they can before, where there's nice shots. It looks like I should be going, oh, that's a decent shot, but I just can't really tell what's happening because of the terrible quality. Luckily the sound's okay though, which is good, because the soundtrack's pretty good. And let's see what we get on the disc. Nothing new again, just the same old stuff, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe this is it for special features. And let's take a look at the case. It's fine, all the info's correct, and it's short and to the point. Not sure why it says raves from the grave, though. Overall then, unfortunately, this was a bit of a disappointment. It was just okay. It lacks massively in characters and in plot, but there's some decent gore in there and some funny dialogue. I'd say if you're a fan of Flesh Eaters 1, then this might be worth checking out so you can see how the series progressed. Outside of that though, if you're just looking for a fun zombie movie, Avoid this one. Check out something like last episode's film, The Zombie Dead. It's miles better than this one. If you wanted a, an upgrade for this, um, because this release is awful, then check out 88 Films' as Blu-ray. Uh, I'm sure it's miles better than this. So, very mixed bag this week. We're carrying on eating the flesh next week, because we're going to be checking out Zombie Flesh Eaters 3, directed by... Clyde Anderson. Hmm. Clyde Anderson is actually a disguise for Claudio Fagrasso, who's probably most famous for directing Troll 2. 
very exciting. Hey up. So, what comes after Zombie Flesh Eaters 2, you might be wondering? Well, the answer is clearly Zombie Flesh Eaters 3. Let's have a look, shall we? So, its official title is After Death, but it was whacked into the Flesh Eaters series here in the UK, and similarly, in the Japan, it was added to their Zombie series, which is just the same bunch of films, it's called Zombie 4, over there. It's a 1989 Italian zombie horror film, and is usually cited as the nail in the coffin of uh, the Italian zombie craze of the 80s. And it's directed not by Clyde Anderson, as that's a pseudonym, it's actually directed by a guy called Claudio Fragasa. Now, viewers of this channel might be familiar with that name, and, you, well, you might just be familiar with that name in general, because he directed the infamous Troll 2, which is clearly on the Dead of Night collection release, which I did a series on those, and there's a link on the screen, I think it's this side, uh, to watch my review of this there. And while I've got you, I'd highly recommend the Eureka box set, which has got Troll 1, Troll 2, and the Best Worst Movie documentary all included in it. Well worth it. Really, really cool set. If you're familiar with Troll 2, you've probably seen some of the clips playing around on YouTube and you pretty much know what you're going to be getting in for with this. Go ahead! What are you waiting for? Aim here! But remember, I'll persecute you after I'm dead. I'll come looking for you to feed on your intestines. I'll be in your nightmares. That's all very well, Chuck. But frankly, I don't want to die on this island. The plot to this one is a bit of a mess. So there's some scientists and they're on an island and they annoy some voodoo dude and he raises the dead. Simultaneously, there is a family on the island, not sure if they're related to the scientists or they just happen to be there, and the family and the scientists all die and the only survivor is the daughter of the family. 20 years later and the daughter finds herself back on the island with a group of friends, maybe? I'm not sure if that's explained at all. Just a group of people that she happens to know. And the dead are still knocking about and killing people. Now, there's also another group on this island, and they are aware of the stuff that happened previously with the scientists, and they're trying to do some research, and they find a Book of the Dead, or Book of Death, as it says on it, and they read from it, and accidentally raise the dead, even though the dead have already been raised and have, we've already seen them and they're already knocking about killing people. Most of this group dies, all except one, and he joins the previously mentioned group with the daughter in it, and some zombies attack, people die, the film gets pretty weird, and then the film ends. So yeah, pretty convoluted for a Flesh Eaters film, wouldn't you say? And this isn't helped by the fact that there's a lot of really slow, drawn out scenes with not much happening, and then big old exposition dumps. It's very complicated and convoluted to the point where the synopsis that I just gave is probably not 100% accurate, but I tried. <laughs> The acting and dubbing in this is hilariously bad. Really cheesy and really strange. Not to the point of Troll 2, but close, close. And I'm glad it's there really because it makes some of the more boring drawn out bits at least have a little bit of merit. The gore's okay, plenty of blood and a lot of oozing gooey stuff. A lot of green oozing stuff actually. Fragasso really has a thing for the colour green, like the fluorescent green bits. Unfortunately, the zombies are really underwhelming. 
and are basically just extras with a bit of face paint on wrapped in like a cloth. The sets get a little confusing as well, like there'll be like caves with lights in the cave and stuff like that and some of the framing is really all over the place, I'll try and find some examples. Um, but there's a great use of colour in this, not as masterfully done as Argento but you can definitely see some influence there and it does elevate a lot of the scenes, makes them at least interesting to look at. problem with this film, as I've mentioned before, lies in its pacing. Now it starts off really strong with a great intro scene that had me kind of hooked. Then it slowly starts getting worse. It dips up and down, there are little bits here and there that I find quite interesting, but by the hour mark I was pretty fed up. But luckily it comes back towards the end and it really ends with a bang. This film also has the same problem as the previous film, in that most of the main characters are packing heat, and the action does just boil down to big buff dudes shooting zombies with guns. Now it does try and make up for this a little bit, because the zombies are a little quicker than we've seen them before, but I don't quite think it makes up for it enough. Also the zombies talk again, and the zombies also carry guns. Zombies with guns. Now I've seen everything. Come on. I want you to be like we are. It'll be a new experience. Let's have a look at this print. Mm, it's, it's a weird one, this. The colours really pop and it looks grey. The darks are really dark and the lights are really light. There's a great contrast going on there and it looks pretty crisp. But the film stock that it was shot on is appalling. It's really grainy and scratchy. Some shots look like barely watchable, whereas others are okay. So it's a real mixed bag. Luckily, the sound is good again though, because this soundtrack is amazing again. And let's see what's on the disc. You know what's on the disc. Nothing new yet again. And let's have a look at this case then. Well at least it's short, but the first paragraph is completely garbled. Not sure if it's missing a word or it's got a word that it shouldn't have in there. No idea. A team of researchers are studying immortality on a remote island to feel the wrath of the zombies. Not sure what it's doing there. Also, it really bigs this film up way too much. While I do agree that it was better than Flesh Eaters 2, this is by no means the best zombie Flesh Eaters ever. Overall then, this was a bit of a mixed set. While I found myself laughing every now and then at the bad acting and dubbing, I was also confused by the plot and bored now and again. If you can shut your brain off to ridiculous plot, then you might get something out of this. And I'd definitely say it was better than last week's. There is fun to be had here. But if you're on the lookout for a Fragasso film, then I would highly recommend Troll 2 instead. Troll 2 is a hilarious sit from start to finish, whereas this is a mildly amusing little zombie film that gets a little dull now and again. If you are interested in this and you're looking for an upgrade, then 88 Films have got you covered yet again with a Blu-ray, and you can have a nice little Flesh Eaters collection from them. So, a bit of a silly one this episode, and I think things are only going to get sillier next episode. We're going to be finishing off this little zombie quadrilogy that we've been having with one of the most ridiculously titled films in the whole collection, Zombie Nosh. 
It's nosh time. Zombie nosh time. That's what it says on the back there. So who's in the mood for checking out a weird zombie film? Well, tough, because that's exactly what we're doing today, and we're looking at Zombie Nosh, one of the stupidest names for a film I've seen in a little while. Otherwise known as Flesh Eater, which is a much better name, it's a 1988 American zombie horror film, written by, directed by, edited by, produced by, and starring Bill Hinsman. Yep, it's one of those films again. Now, Bill Hinsman is probably best known for portraying one of the zombies in George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. And to say that this film is slightly influenced by this is a bit of an understatement. I just wanted to get together with you and have some fun, you know, full around. First time I met you at Julie's party, I wanted to be with you. Well, maybe you don't understand what I'm trying to say, but when Julie fixed us up to go on this hayride together, I was really excited about it. So the plot for this one starts with teenagers on a hayride. They get off at a random point and decide to start camping in the middle of nowhere. They accidentally unearth a zombie, and then the zombie just kills them all. Now, around this point, I thought that the film was wrapping up, but it turns out we're actually only 30 minutes in, and the film just keeps going. So now all the teenagers are zombies, and they head out into the local town and start just killing whoever they can find. Then the police get involved, and the remaining townsfolk all get armed and get involved and start just headshotting the zombies. Then they burn a barn, and the film ends. This is one of those films where it feels like it could have ended around four different points, but it just keeps on going. Here's what I liked about the film then. Um, so first off, the acting is fantastically awful. I was laughing quite a lot at some terribly delivered lines, and I don't think that there's a good actor in the entire film. Also, it's quite gory, which I always enjoy. Uh, there's Some gore effects can be quite good, if a little campy, but, you know, I, I quite like some campy gore every now and then, and it gives it quite a lot of charm with things like bright red blood and... Halloween shop skeletons and stuff like that. And finally, I guess you could also say that the film was quite unpredictable. I had no idea where the plot was going, especially because I kept thinking it was going to wrap up. And after they killed all those kids quite early on, who I thought were going to be the main characters, I had no idea what was going to happen. I'm scared you did it, I. Yeah, well, you're a real <laughs> jerk, you know, man? Why don't you just stop playing your games and give us some help here? Oh, excuse me, boss. You see, I must have come up here with the wrong impression. I thought we were here to have fun. Chris, Mom told you to wait. Who cares? You're gonna get in trouble. Come on, there's people everywhere. It's not gonna be long till they're here. I think we've seen just one too many cheesy zombie flicks. Wow. What the hell's with them? Uh, we're just a bunch of losers that crashed the party. And now let's take a look at what I didn't like in the film. The pacing is pretty all over the place. It starts relatively action-packed, but it was really losing me by that second half. Also, the editing is pretty bad. It's got like awkward pauses in there, and it has a bad habit of leaving uh, too much space in between pieces of dialogue in a conversation which just comes across as unnatural. And it keeps cutting to black and then fading back in which just comes across as really amateurish. And the zombies are quite underwhelming as well. Uh, a few of them are okay but mostly it's just people in white face paint. 
I think though I might have been a little bit spoiled by some of the uh, designs for the Italian zombies. <laughs> pretty glaring thing that I think is worth mentioning about this film is just how damn sleazy it can be. There's a lot of scenes of nudity and there's a lot of very long scenes of kissing with really loud sound effects over the top. And Bill Hinsman, the director and also plays the uh, main zombie, has a tendency of appearing through a lot of these nude scenes. He sort of ambles in, looking a bit like Dirty Den, and he like gropes these naked girls for about three minutes, and then sort of bites them on the naked bodies. It's uncomfortable, and it does feel like this is the entire reason for him making this film. Let's take a look at the print. It's okay, it's fine, clear and watchable. There's the odd flicker here and there, but for the most part, it's fine. At the hour mark, I don't know whether it was my DVD or the print, but it does go a little bit weird, where it goes a bit pixelated and jumps a bit, but that was the only instance of that. And at around the 50 minute mark, the sound goes a bit strange, and there's like a hiss behind the dialogue. Don't know if it's just not being converted across properly or something like that. But there are only minor instances in an otherwise passable release. And let's have a look at what we get on the disc. Same old, same old. As per usual. <laughs> My name's Steve. Yeah, Steve, I met Steve. I don't even know, Paul. And now for the case. Now this is a bit of a longer one than we used to see in recently, and it's loaded up with silly zombie puns. All the info is correct, although it does make it out to have a clearer through line than it actually does. Also, I think here where it says Zomol, it's supposed to say Zomba. That's a pretty stupid mistake, unless there is such a thing as a Zomol that I'm just completely unaware of. Overall then, this is a film that started out good, but got pretty bad as it went along. There's some funny bits and some decent gore here, but the sleaziness and the really bad editing brings it down quite a lot. If you're looking for a bottom of the barrel zombie film to have a laugh at with mates, then this'll do the job, but there are better examples out there. Also, if you're looking for an upgrade on this, I'm afraid you're out of luck. This is your lot in the UK, but it's not awful. So, pretty mediocre film this week, and the end of our zombie quadrilogy. But we're starting a new one next time. We're looking at the House of Quadrilogy. And the first film up is Lucio Fulci's The House of Clocks. So, with the four in a row zombie films over and done with, we're now moving onto a new quadrilogy, the Houses of Doom quadrilogy. And we're kicking this off with a film that I remember really enjoying as a kid and one of my earliest Vipco DVDs, The House of Clocks. So this was made for an Italian TV show that was shelved called Houses of Doom. And it's a 1989 Italian horror film directed by Vipco favourite, Lucio Fulci. If you like slowly opening doors, ominous shadows, and fake out jump scare cats, then you're in for a treat. Diana!
my lighter. The plot follows three small time burglars who plan to rob the house of an old couple. But they're in for a weird one. When they accidentally kill the old couple, all the countless clocks in the place start going really strange, and everything just gets crazy from there. I really like the plot to this one. It kept me guessing throughout, and it's got quite an original and fantastical premise. You look fine today. <laughs> you killed my fair! We welcome you into our home with open arms and open hearts. This film's got a lot going for it. Uh, the acting and dubbing is pretty good. Uh, there's a few funny lines here and there, but outside of that, it's spot on. And the gore's really good too. Um, it's not too over the top, and what we do get is really well made. This film's also good at building suspense. It's good at lingering on a shot for just long enough just to draw you in, and I really like that atmosphere. Uh, the sets are fantastic, really like the house, and the cinematography and some shots are really well done. I'd go so far as to say that this is one of Fulci's best films, and it's definitely up there with The Beyond and City of the Living Dead. Let me okay with me. <laughs> Let me tell you. If I remember the word, uh, just to describe it, uh, bees have been peeing in a lake. Tony. What is it? Tony, come here. No. Stay there. This film really delivers on the clocks. It's called House of Clocks, and it doesn't disappoint. I also really love the twisted sound effects it gives to the clocks when they're going all weird. I also wanted to mention the old couple. They're brilliantly twisted and strange and every time they're on screen they're a joy to watch. And finally, I want to mention the ending. I won't spoil it here, but it's a damn good ending. And let's take a look at the print. It's fine. Didn't notice any issues with this one at all. Pretty good job. And let's see what we get on the disc. What do you think we get on the disc? Nothing new again. And let's take a look at this case. Again, it's all right. It's split into three columns like a newspaper for some reason, but all the info is correct. They give Fulci a nice little write-up as well, but they do say that this is one of the more entertaining movies from Fulci, which to me kind of implies that he's done a lot of boring ones. One more thing to mention, the DVD distribution company changes here. On all the previous films, it was S. Golden Sons, and now it's Black Horse Entertainment. I was hoping that we might get some different stuff, a correct logo perhaps, or maybe some special features. But no, it's all exactly the same. Shame really, as I was hoping for things to change up a little. Overall then, this film was a lot of fun, and I would definitely recommend it. It's suspenseful, funny, well shot and gory. Unfortunately, if you were in the market for an upgrade, which I am, there isn't one available at all, this is the only way of getting this film. I think Beyond Terror released it, but I'm guessing it's just exactly the same print. Not that there's anything wrong with this print, but if a film deserved a Blu-ray release, it's this one. Arrow, 88 films, second sight. What are you doing? Pull your finger out and give us a Blu-ray of this, will you? So, fantastic film this week, and we're carrying on not only with the Houses of Doom quadrilogy, but we've also got another one directed by Fulcher. Let's hope it lives up to this week's film, because we're going to be checking out The Sweet House of Horrors. Hey, up. 
Another week, another Fulci film, and the second part of the Houses of Doom quadrilogy. How does this hold up to House of Clocks? Let's have a look, shall we? The Sweet House of Horrors is a 1989 Italian fantasy horror film, as you've probably guessed, directed by Lucio Fulci, and it was shot within the same four-week period that House of Clocks was shot in as well, and the set looks very similar. Now this shows a much tamer side to Fulci, which we've not really seen so far in this collection. As I was saying, uh, the contract is... <laughs> So the plot of this one's pretty straightforward. The parents of two kids are murdered, and the aunt and uncle move into the house to raise the kids. At some point they decide to sell the house, but weird things start happening, and the kids just aren't right. Now, something about this plot just didn't sit right with me, and I want to mention it here. So this is a little spoiler warning, if you wanted to watch this film blindly, without knowing anything about the ins and outs of stuff, then you've been warned. So, the ghosts of the parents move back into the house, basically, and they trap the kids in the house with the uh, idea that they love the kids and they want to raise them. Now, I don't like this because they're basically ruining any chance of a normal life these kids could have had by trapping them in and, ra and ghosts raising them. And the film is on the side of the ghosts, I believe. It seems to be on their side and it paints everybody else as an antagonist when really they're just trying to help out the aunt and uncle are planning on selling the house but they said that they're going to give all the money to the kids and they also just want to raise them right which seems like a noble thing to do and everybody else who's involved they are doing things for monetary gain but they're just doing the jobs at the end of the day and they do seem like they genuinely want to help out i don't know it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way i guess stupid ghosts There is one reason why I always win all my battles. It is a weapon not everybody has. Most people have an absurd, infantile fear of ghosts, but I scorn them, and that <laughs> is my secret weapon. The acting and dubbing is fine for the most part. We get the odd line here and there that sounds a little bit weird, but it's all passable. That is, except for the kids, whose dubbing is absolutely ridiculous. It's clearly two adults voicing them, and they kind of steal the show whenever they're on screen, and they get all the best lines. Uh, the gore and visual effects are minimal. We get some nice bits of gore at the beginning, and a nice bit at the end, but that's it really. What we do get though is really well made, and it's a shame because I'd have liked to have seen a bit more of it. The film's shot really nicely, the sets are good, and there's also some quite interesting camera work in there too. Aren't bad people, they're simply idiots. Oh, make things worse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to get a doctor. They're just dying. Sausage, just dying. Sausage, just dying. Oh. 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 Mr. Cody, what's the matter? My hand! Here, let me take a look. Try to stand up. I do think this film is a little too tame for its own good. It tends to lean more towards the whimsical and away from the horror, which is a shame really, and I was checking out by the 45 minute mark, but luckily the end is quite good. 
Also, it reuses quite a bit of footage. There's like a big-ish section, and it's all surrounding the uh, reveal of the killer, which is really early on in this, by the way. And it just comes across as cheap. But I mean, if you take into account that this was shot back to back with House of Clocks within four weeks, it kind of makes sense it being a little bit cheap. With how tame it is though, it does make this film feel like a really strange inclusion into the Vipco collection. And I'm guessing they've only got it in here, one because it's Fulche, and two because it's part of the House of Doom quadrilogy. Uh, and I would not have given this an 18 certificate, that seems ridiculous, there's barely anything in it, just a little bit of gore at the beginning and at the end. Sarah, I had a dream just now. There were two pretty little flames flying all around, like two butterflies. You know, I did too. I knew it. I told Mark, but he didn't believe me. I did too. I knew you could hear him. Mama! <laughs> it was a long, hard trip for us to get you, baby. But now that you're here, you've got to stay forever. Don't go away anymore, Papa, please. Let's take a look at the print. It's fine, really. Clear visuals, clear audio, and once again, we get a really good soundtrack. And what do we get on the disc? Same as we always get on the disc. But in case you're new here, I'll fill you in. We get stills, filmographies, chapter select, and four repeated trailers. It's been a little while. Just fancied saying it again, really. And let's take a look at the case. It's all fine, really. Gives the film a nice write-up, and there's no errors as far as I can see. And they are right that this film does feel like a fairy tale, although not really in a good way, in my opinion. Overall then, this was an interesting, but disappointing set. It was fascinating seeing a tame aside to Fulshe, but it did hinder the film and it made it really drag on. Also, that questionable plot is kind of off-putting. I would only recommend this to die-hard Fulshi fans. If you're looking for anything Fulshi to watch, you might get something out of this. Outside of that though, I wouldn't bother. And honestly, I preferred House of Clocks. If you were looking for an upgrade or a Blu-ray of this, I'm afraid you're out of luck. This is your lot in the UK. But honestly, the print was decent and it's probably worth picking up for cheap. So, not the worst, but not the best. And this is the end now of Fulci's efforts into the Houses of Doom quadrilogy. Let's see how Umberto Lenzi fares, because next episode we're going to be checking out... The House of Lost Souls. So once again, we're carrying on with the House of Doom quadrilogy, but we're moving away from Fulcher this week, and we're taking a look at the House of Lost Souls. Now this is a 1989 Italian horror film, surprise surprise, directed by Umberto Lenze, who you may recognise from directing Eaten Alive, which we covered in episode 9, and Ghost House, which we covered in episode 23, and if memory serves, I enjoyed both of these. I remember enjoying Ghost House, I remember thinking that was a lot of fun. Eating Alive, I think I got on with. So hopefully, that'll carry on with this one. There's really not much information about this knocking about online. And the same can be said for a lot of the Houses of Doom films, honestly. I guess they just weren't very well documented because they were made for TV. Kevin, you swear up and down that the bad weather doesn't start till the end of November. Even Irishmen are wrong once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say we get together later? I'm too tired. And there's something else. What? I don't like the face of that man. There's one thing I find perplexing. Have you taken a good look around? Have you seen the state this motel is in? Let's investigate the telephone. <laughs> The film follows a group of six. There's five geologists and one tag-along kid. Now the film might have mentioned why he's with these geologists, but for the life of me I can't remember. They've been working on some mountain somewhere, and they move into a new location. But there's a roadblock, so they decide to stay the night in this strange hotel that they find. 
things get weird and people get decapitated. Oh yeah, and one of the geologists happens to be a psychic and they make a bit of a big deal out of it. Even though everybody pretty much at some point has weird hallucinations or visions or whatever it is. So there's that element to this as well. Honestly though, I did really like this plot. There was enough happening to keep me entertained all the way throughout and I can even forgive it for the false advertising because it's set in a hotel, not a house. doctors gave you a reasonable explanation. They said that you have psychic powers. You're a medium. I don't want to be a medium. I don't. We're all normal kids, Carla. But that doesn't mean we can't have a hallucination every now and then. And Jay, he's preparing a script for a nice little horror film. <laughs> for once, the characters aren't all arseholes. They're dumb, sure but they're the most likeable bunch of characters I've seen in a Vipco film recently. There's some silly lines and some weird dubbing, but it never falls into the awful category. It's always just amusing and entertaining. And we also get another weird kid. I don't know what it is about this half of the Vipco reviews, but we've had a lot of weird kids recently. One fantastic point about this film is definitely its pacing. I rarely got bored because it keeps moving and enough is definitely happening that I was engaged throughout. Touring? We're geology students. I'm not. They are. Have you ever heard of the calcareous paleolithic formations of the reddish Alps around here? Paleo, eh? Oh, for a Pepsi and a hamburger slathered in mustard, ketchup, mayo and pickles. Wow, what a meal, kids. <laughs> <laughs> We get all kinds of monsters in this. Zombies, ghosts, killer washing machines, and that's just to name a few. So the variety is really good here. I was expecting a little bit more from the gore. It's quite tame. The effects that we get are quite good, and there's some great death scenes. Not sure if it's cut though, or it might just be tamer than I was expecting because again, it's made for TV. Who knows? The cinematography is pretty standard, but the set is really good. I love what they did with the hotel, even if it's not a house. The print for this is great. Very clear audio and very clear visuals. It might be one of the best ones that I've seen uh, in this half, maybe. Apart from one little thing that I did notice, just it's very short, but it sounds like it's an issue with the dubbing. It sounds to me like they layered in the dubbing twice. Either that or there's somebody talking in the background. But you get a sort of a weird overlap in the voice. I'll show the clip. It's only very short, so I might end up showing it twice. I can't remember how long it is now. Um, but it's just a weird little thing that I, that I spotted. And what do we get on the disc? Same thing we always get on the disc. And to be honest with you, we're that close to the end now. Bloody Moon is the last one. We're that close to the end that I do not think that is going to change anytime soon. Foretell something that's going to take place somewhere in the future. I, I get brief flashes on what's already happened. Here. I, I get brief... I get brief... Now let's look at the case. It's pretty good, sums it up well, and it's to the point with no errors. This bit here though is a little bit weird. I wouldn't say this film is scary in the slightest. And the mental out of your tree part would have suited something like Zombie Dead a hell of a lot better, I think. Overall then, this was a lot of fun. It was engaging, and it made me laugh quite a few times. I'd say this would be perfect for a stupid movie night in with friends. If you were looking for an upgrade, I'm afraid you're out of luck in the UK. Again, this is your lot. It seems like the Houses of Doom just have not got that Blu-ray release they deserve. 
But to be honest, this print's pretty decent. If you can pick it up for cheap, it'd be well worth it. So, pretty good this week. And let's see if Umberto Lenzi can crack out another good film for the last film in the Houses of Doom quadrilogy. That's right, we're finally finishing it. And we're finishing it with... The House of Witchcraft. Love a good witch film. Let's get the Houses of Doom quadrilogy over and done with, shall we? I'm really starting to miss variety. So we're finishing up with The House of Witchcraft, which is, of course, a 1989 Italian horror film, directed again by Umberto Lenza. And I think that this has the least amount of information online out of the entire quadrilogy. Is it any better than some of the other Lenzi films we've had so far in the series? No, it's not. Look out, we're gonna hit it! Palmer, how are you, Luke? Night nice surprise. Tell me about life out of the big city. Getting to relax a bit? The plot follows a man who has a recurring dream about a witch boiling his head. His wife suggests that they go and stay out in the country somewhere to get away for a while. But weird things start happening and the man suspects that his wife is actually the witch who's killing all the other guests. This one is a bit of a slow one. It just kind of plods around and unfortunately there's minimal witch in it. Which is a shame, because the witch is the best bit. Which bit? The witch bit. and dubbing in this film are of course terrible but there aren't too many funny lines here so it isn't saved by being hilariously bad the sets are fine and the cinematography is serviceable and once again we only get minimal gore effects but the ones that we do get are really well made it's kind of a running theme for these four films really and it's a bit annoying because you just want to see more of the good effects this film falls into that category of being one of those films where someone in the group goes missing. So the rest of the group slowly sneak around the house, trying to find out what's happened to the missing member whilst being picked off one by one. Now, this as a structure can really work. You need to really build on that suspense and you need a really good threat. Unfortunately, this film falls flat because not a lot happens, it's really boring and there are no stakes at all. Six months I've been plagued by a recurring nightmare. Almost every night, there's a country house and a horrible old woman standing next to a fire in the hearth. She lifts up my severed head and throws it into a steaming cauldron. There aren't really any standout moments in this film, outside of scenes with the witch in it, but they only stand out because the witch has got a silly face. There was one throwaway line that grabbed my attention though. Uh, the main character references a film called The Vision of the Sabbath, and he references it in a way of the plot, the, the things that are happening to him is very similar to the plot of this film. And I was wondering if it was real or not, because if it wasn't real, what was the point in bringing it up? And it turns out that there was a film called La Vision del Sabbath, Italian film, directed by a guy called Marco Bellocchio that was released the year before this film came out. 
And looking at the reviews, it actually looked pretty decent. Might have found a decent Italian witch film here, and I wouldn't mind checking it out. You there's just no way she killed the priest, and you know it. Let's hope. Have you seen that film, uh, The Vision of a Sabbath? Uh, I believe I did. About a witch, I think, in France. She's born again, reincarnated into a girl of today. The print is once again really good, very clear audio and very clear visuals, with only a few minor imperfections, you know, there was a, a line going down the screen at one point and there was a little audio glitch, but outside of that, looks great, sounds great. And once again, we get nothing new on the disc, same old stuff. And let's have a look at this case. It's fine with all the information being correct, but again it does try and make out like this is a scary film. It's really not, and this might be the least scary out of all of the Houses of Doom films. One thing that I did notice, a bit of an oversight here, is that this screenshot here actually ruins the twist ending to the film. So hopefully you're not paying too much attention to the screenshots on the back of those. Overall then, this was a massive letdown. Not enough happens and they don't utilise the witch enough. It's a massive shame as well because this, looking at the collection, this is the only film about a witch. And I was really looking forward to it. Ah well. I wouldn't recommend this one unless you're wanting to watch all of the Houses of Doom films or you're a massive Umberto Lenzi fan and you just need to see everything that he's ever put out. Once again, there is no Blu-ray release for this in the UK, but if you really must see this, this print is fine. So there we go. The Houses of Doom films are finished, and to celebrate, I'm going to go through worst to best. With my worst one, of course, being the film we just spoke about. Far too boring for its own good. Not enough happening. Next up, we've got The Sweet House of Horrors, which was a bit of a weird set. Uh, there were some funny moments in this, but it was just a little too whimsical for its own good. Next up, The House of Lost Souls. Really fun film. Really enjoyed this one and I'd recommend it. And finally, my favourite, The House of Clocks. Again, a really fun film that I'd recommend and this only just wins out down to nostalgia, I think. This is my first Vitco film that I ever owned. So, a little bit of nostalgia goggles for it. So it seems like both Fulshe and Lenze had one good film and one bad film in this collection. And that's it. The Houses of Doom quadrilogy is over. I cannot wait for something different. And we've got a real treat next week, because we're checking out a Jalo film. One that I've really been looking forward to watching. I've heard some really good things about this. We're going to be checking out The Case of the Bloody Iris. Very northern tile. Been looking forward to this week's film. Big fan of Jarlo, and this one does not disappoint. The case of the Bloody Iris. I love how northern it can sound. Otherwise known by the slightly more ridiculous title, Why Those Strange Drops of Blood on Jennifer's Body is a 1972 Italian Jarlo film. For those who don't know, Jarlo is basically the name given to a usually violent or sleazy whodunit film. Uh, and this one's directed by uh, Guillermo Carnemio, probably butchered that, um, going under Anthony Ascot in this film. You may recognise Carnemio, um, he directed the uh, Santana series of spaghetti westerns, which Arrow have put out on Blu-ray. Um, or you might recognise him for directing Ratman, and I really need to check out Ratman, because he's the critter from the shitter. The 
plot follows Jennifer, a stripper turned model who has moved out into a new apartment building to escape from her orgy obsessed ex husband. Unfortunately for Jennifer, though, the apartment building is the stomping ground to a masked serial killer, and it's only a matter of time before she's the next victim. But luckily, the cops and the landlord are on the case. It's a typical plot for this sort of film, but it's executed extremely well. It keeps the pace up, there are rarely any boring parts, and there's a lot of fun characters to latch onto. I won't ruin the ending for you here though, it kinda defeats the purpose. Well you won't have her, you bastard, because she's mine, mine! Are you crazy? No one's gonna have her except me, Jennifer belongs to me, soul and body, she's mine and I'll kill anyone who comes near her! <laughs> Come on, have a drink, there's cognac, gin, there's uh, garters, brassiers. The acting and dubbing are actually pretty decent this time. It's a little melodramatic in parts, but it's probably the best I've seen in a while, really. And some of the funny lines actually seemed intentional for a change. The gore is restrained, yet really well executed. And the sets and cinematography are fantastic. There's some really nice use of shots and lighting. And also the music's pretty good. All around just a pretty decently well-made film. Don't they? As long as there isn't blood all over the place. Ah, most people wouldn't do that. An aspect that kind of lets this film down is some of the values that it holds. It's very old fashioned. There's some racist comments in there, and there's some quite homophobic themes throughout as well, which might put some people off. Oh, yeah, and there's a ton of nudity as well, but I mean, that's kind of expected for the genre. It's a shame as well though, because a lot of the cool death scenes have got nudity in them, so I can't actually show them here. But, oh well, you just have to check it out for yourself, aren't you? Look, Commissioner, I'm not interested in your sex fantasies. You Go didn't... back and play stamp collector, why don't you? And you call yourself a policeman? From what I see, you couldn't find a pig in a poke! Once again, the print is pretty decent. I've been quite impressed with some of these recent releases that we've been looking at. They've really upped the game in the print department. It was a little mucky for about five to 10 minutes, but it cleared up. And there was one little weird thing that I did notice with the sound. There was one shot about halfway through where whenever it was that shot, the audio was only coming out of the right speaker. Uh, but outside of that, it was clean, very watchable, nice colors really popped and a decent example of a Vipco release. And on the disc, you probably guessed, nothing new. Let's have a look at this case then. It's pretty good, all the info's correct. It might give away a little too much information though, but it does give it a really nice write-up. This line here seems a little bit mean. She's more flirty than anything. I wouldn't go all the way and call her lecherous. It just seems cruel. And this bit here didn't age well in an era of far too many Hollywood remakes. Honestly, this film's fine the way it is. Overall then, I would definitely say that this is one of the best films in the collection so far. It was entertaining, well made, and a lot of fun. If you're already a fan of Jarlo films, then this is a must watch if you haven't seen it yet. If you're new to the genre, and you're interested in what you've seen, then this is just as good of a starting off point as any of them really. So I definitely recommend this, just be aware it's a little old fashioned. If you're looking for an upgrade on this, then you're in luck, because Shameless have got you covered with a Blu-ray, I'd say that's probably worth grabbing. But if you saw this for cheap out and about, you could do a hell of a lot worse. So, excellent, excellent film this week, very impressed. And that's only going to go downhill from here, because next week, Next week, we are checking out. I've been waiting for this one. Oh. Flesh eating mothers. Meet the ladies who lunch. <sighs> Dear me.
Hey up. So, I was really expecting the worst from this week's film. Just judging by the title alone, I thought I was in for another nostril picker or something like that. But you know what? Lucky for me, it turned out to be alright. Let's have a look, shall we? Flesh Eating Mothers is a 1988 American comedy horror film directed by James Avils Martin, which you probably said wrong, and he hasn't really done anything outside of this. The closest we get to a famous name in this is somebody called Valerie Hubbard, who's done a lot of TV work. There's very little information on this and the director online, except from the fact that this was shot in about four weeks. Which, you know what? Yeah, I can kind of tell. I'm torn on this one. There's going to be a lot of good and a lot of bad things to say about this. Why not? A man's got to stay in shape. Uh... Hey, Mom, can we have some money for the ice cream man? The film follows a neighborhood of families. All the mothers get this strange disease that turns them into flesh-eating crazies, so the kids, with the help of a mortician, set out to try and save them. It's a basic yet ridiculous plot that spends a lot of time cracking wise and making its actors say stupid things about mothers, but it keeps the pace and rarely gets boring although the premise does get a little old by the last third. The humour is hit and miss. There's some really obvious jokes in here, you know, like the mothers are acting like stereotypical mothers, but the monsters as well, you know, that sort of stuff. But on the other side of that, there are some genuinely funny lines in. I did find myself laughing every now and then. Oh dear, what is it? I don't remember if I unplugged the iron before I left the house. Oh, I hate when that happens. Don't you? My mother? She just ate my brother. Yeah, our mothers too. My mother ate your mothers? No, my mother ate my father. She's never done anything like this before. Mom? Mom? Louder. Mommy? Oh, mommy? The acting is deliciously terrible, with everyone clearly being very amateur. They give a very large speaking role to the dude that plays the mortician, which is mad because he is by far the worst actor. It's all very charming though, and the bad acting really does help with some of the uh, heavier exposition filled scenes. Speaking of the cast as well, something I noticed was um, there's a guy who's double cast in this. He plays a doctor and he plays a policeman. Something a bit weird about this, though, um, as the Doctor, he reminded me of George Costanza from Seinfeld. And as a policeman, he reminded me of Newman, also from Seinfeld. Strange, huh? Listen, you just missed Commissioner Dixon by 15 minutes. They took the bodies of wife and son away before I had even had a chance to give him a thorough examination. <laughs> This card is what you saw syphilis or gonorrhea. The gore is pretty minimal here, and what we do get isn't great. Maybe outside of like two or three scenes. Specifically the last scene actually, which has got some of the best gore in the whole film. They really did save the best for last with this one. The designs of the fleshy mothers are crazy. I really like what they did with them, and they really fit with the over-the-top nature of the film. Outside of that, camera work and sets are all pretty basic, nothing really stood out, and the music is just a bit weird, really. You've got some really repetitive, annoying parts mixed in with some knockoff 80s jams. Special 
The print on this one isn't grey. It's in 4x3, it's a little blurry and muddy. Luckily the film isn't too dark of a film, so it doesn't really hinder the experience too much. It's passable, but not grey. I also noticed a little bit of stuttering, but that could have just been how I was playing it back. I've been playing it on a PS5. PS5 is a bit weird with DVDs sometimes, so it might just be that. And on the disc, we get nothing new yet again, but we do get the funniest filmographies I think I've ever seen. Out of the entire cast for this film, people who've done the odd bit here and there, they managed to choose three people who have only done this film. Man. One more thing I wanted to talk about as well. Something new has happened with these Vipco releases. They're starting with this one, and I'm hoping that it continues as we go along. After the incorrect Vaults of Horror logo, and before the menu, we get a trailer. That's right, a pre-menu trailer. But what's this trailer for, you're probably wondering. Well, it's for a film called The Claw, or One Hell of a Christmas, it's also known as. And it looks terrible. Absolutely appalling. I might have to check it out. I'm also not sure why it's even included on this disc. Because as far as I can see, it's got no affiliation with Vipco at all. It doesn't look like they put this out. Maybe they were planning on putting it out and then the company went bust or something like that. I've got no idea. But to be honest, I'm just happy something new's happened. Pussy Carlitos. Right, let's have a look at this case. There's not a lot here, but there's still stuff to say. So straight away you can probably spot a load of wordplay. Heinous housewives, blood crazed carnivores, they knew this wasn't one to take seriously. If that's the case then, I'm not too sure why they described it as spine chilling does not fit with this film at all. Also, not sure what sheds a new light on the mystery of maternity actually means. I'm guessing they just wanted maternity, mothers, oh we've got to try and fit that in somewhere. But it just seems odd. Outside of this though, all the info's correct. Overall then, this was a weird one. And I am still in two minds about it, really. I think it caught me in a good mood, because I found myself laughing along and just enjoying the absurdity of it all. But it's a tough one to recommend. I'd say it's probably best for a bad movie night with friends. I know I say that a lot, but we are talking about the Bloody Vipco collection here. I wouldn't watch this alone. I don't think you'll get much from it. If you were wanting an upgrade, then 88 Films have got you covered with a Blu-ray, and I'd suggest seeking that one out, because the print on this isn't great, really. So, pleasant surprise this week, and hopefully that'll carry on next week, because we're watching the first and the only werewolf film in the entire collection. We're going to be taking a look at... The Werewolf of Washington. Funny well on the background. Hey up. Time for a werewolf film, I think. And it's the only werewolf film in the entire screen time collection. So let's hope it's a good one. The Werewolf of Washington is a 1973 American political satire werewolf film directed by Milton Moses Ginsburg, and this is pretty much the only thing he's done. And it stars Dean Stockwell, who's famous for being in Quantum Leap, which I grew up with as a kid, and Blue Velvet, which I also grew up watching as a kid. So apparently this was written in 10 days, and it's a satire of the Watergate scandal, which I do not know much about at all. Which might be why I didn't find it too funny. 
you know what time, the, 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 the departure schedule of the train? That he actually prefers some of the Russian communists to get the liberal com <coughs> columnists in this country. The plot follows Jack, played by Dean Stockwell. He's the president's aide, and whilst working away in Budapest, he gets bitten by a werewolf. When he returns, he has to try and convince the higher-ups that he is a werewolf, so they can prevent him from killing other people. People do get killed though, there's some comical transformation scenes where he's trying to hide it whilst at an important meeting, and finally there's a showdown on a helicopter. Now after saying all that, would you believe that this film is actually pretty boring? At least up until the last third anyway. There's no on-screen kills, there's very little werewolf action, and there is far too much bumbling presidential nonsense. So it's a werewolf. A weird wolf? A weird wolf. Werewolf. <laughs> Dean Stockwell steals the show here. He is by far the most competent actor and a joy to watch both as a human and as a werewolf. I'll tell you who's not a joy to watch though, the president's daughter. She is just painful. There's barely any violence to mention, the sets and cinematography are all very standard, and the transformation effects can be amateurish, but can also be quite endearing. Wait! Wait! What is your name? What? What is your name? You have a name! I would definitely say that this film is political satire first and werewolf film second but I didn't really laugh throughout the whole film. Now, I, I don't know too much about 70s American politics, you know, the Nixon era and the Watergate scandal and all that sort of stuff, which might not have helped, but just by looking at it, it didn't really seem too funny. I guess that's because political jokes don't age particularly well. And especially nowadays, a lot of the jokes just came across as plausible. Our credibility is at stake throughout the world. No, I will not be found wanting in this nuclear age. Let's have a look at this print then. It is absolutely terrible. Terrible. It flickers, it's grainy, it stutters from time to time. It looks like somebody got some really crappy film stock and convert it over onto an overly used VHS. The colours flash in and out from time to time, and the blacks are very, very crushed. This is one of the worst prints we've had in a long time. And on the desk, nothing new, same old, same old. And we even get the claw trailer repeated before the menu. Something tells me that that's gonna be a regular occurrence. Maybe even up until the very end of the screen time collection now. Let's have a look at this case. Well, straight away they got the director wrong. Nina Shulman is the editor, not the director. And they even put it on the back too. Pretty stupid mistake, which they corrected on the disc, so they must have known that they went wrong somewhere. No idea how this one got past them. Once again, there's tons of puns and wordplay, and they really bang on about Dean Stockwell, even putting him on the front cover. I guess he is all the film's got going for it though. One more thing that I did notice, um, so the trailer for The Claw is on, obviously, at the beginning of this DVD and the last one. On the back here, at the bottom, it says, Program 2004 Nice Guy Limited, which I believe Nice Guy does have something to do with The Claw. So they do get a little credit on the back there, so I could have a little check and see if this is a running thing for 
the rest of the Scream Time collection. Overall then, this film was pretty bad. It was unfunny, it was dull, and there was only Dean Stockwell and a few scenes towards the end to save it. I would definitely not recommend this. And as far as I can see, there are no re-releases or Blu-rays or upgrades for this in the UK currently. Meaning you're stuck with this print, so I would just avoid this one altogether. So, terrible film this week. Let's hope next week's is any better. And it should be because there's been a lot of build-up for this. It's been advertised on nearly every film in the Vipco Scream Time collection so far. Will it live up to the heart? We're going to be checking out Psychic Killer. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Hey up. This one's been a long time coming then, hasn't it? So, for those who haven't seen my other Scream Time reviews, one, what the hell are you doing with yourself? And two, you'd be unaware, but this film has been advertised on nearly every other DVD in this collection so far. So you could say there's quite a bit of hype around it. Does it live up to it? Let's have a look, shall we? Psychic Killer is a 1975 American horror film directed by Ray Danton, who has directed and starred in a hell of a lot of TV. The cast also consists of a lot of TV regulars as well, all with very long filmographies. We've got Jim Hutton, I'm going to have to read these because I cannot remember the names. Jim Hutton, Julie Adams and Paul Burke and that's just to name a few. You could say that this film has the most competent cast out of any film in the collection so far. We follow a fellow called Masters, who is wrongfully imprisoned. Whilst locked up, he learns the ability to leave his body through psychic powers. When he's finally released after being proven innocent, he sets about psychically seeking revenge on those who wronged him, but there's a cop and a doctor on his case and they're hunting him down. It's a simple and very weird story, told extremely well, and along with the pacing, makes for a very enjoyable set. The acting, for a change, is actually fantastic here. I was drawn into a lot of the scenes and you can tell that they got professional actors in for this one. There's not much gore to speak of really with this film, but what we do get is tastefully done and there's some really entertaining death scenes as well, such as the shower scene and the butcher scene, just to name a few highlights. The cinematographer and the score, the fine, the Standard, but not to the point of feeling boring. They fit very well with the film. Anything to help you with your obsession, Lieutenant? You know what my real obsession was? You might not be so obliging. With my luck, it'd be necrophilia. <laughs> There isn't really much more to say about this one. It was fun, engaging, and way more competently made than most of the other films that we've seen in this collection so far. So, yeah, I guess it kind of did live up to the hype, and I can see why they were pushing the trailer as much as they were. Well done. Now the print is another matter entirely. So it is clear 
you can see what's happening and the colours are quite vivid and pop. But it's covered in grain and scratches and the edits do this weird thing where they sort of flicker in and out and it looks to me like a good transfer of very dirty film stock. Luckily though it didn't really hinder my enjoyment of the film. And on the disc we do get some differences here. There is no uh, Vipco logo or the Claw trailer before the menu, it's just a warning and then menu. And we only get two trailers this time, one for Shogun Assassin and one for Psychic Killer. At least they left the Psychic Killer one in, that would have been a really bad move if they'd not. And outside of that, we only get stills and chapter select, we don't get filmographies, even though this film has a bunch of actors in it who actually have filmographies. Seems like a really weird exclusion. Time to look at the case. There's not really much to say here. It's completely fine. All the info's correct, and it reads well. I guess the only thing of no is that there are a lot of screenshots. Overall, then, I really enjoyed this film. I had a great time watching it. The acting's decent for a Vipco film. The plot's a lot of fun, and it really keeps the pace. I would definitely give this one a recommendation. Especially for fans of horror films with a weirder side and more of a thriller feel to them. The only problem is, is that there is no Blu-ray release for this in this country. So you're either stuck in Porn, which I know Vinegar Syndrome have put out a Blu-ray in America, or you've got this crappy print version, so not amazing options there. But, really good film, really fun, and let's hope that continues into next week. I think it should. I've been recommended this one a few times and I've been really looking forward to checking it out. We're gonna be having a look at Night of the Demon. So, who else here is a fan of Bigfoot? Personally, I've got a real soft spot for Bigfoot's back catalogue, so I was really looking forward to this one. And even though the name might not suggest it, this is in fact a Bigfoot film. Let's have a look, shall we? Night of the Demon, not to be confused with Night of the Demon from the 50s that Arrow have re-released, is a 1980 American slasher Bigfoot film, directed by a fellow called James Wasson, who, as far as I can see, hasn't done anything else. Now, this is another film that was on the infamous Video Nasties list in the 80s, so you know what that means. Cuts all over the bloody shop. Hooray. Who wants to dance? You promised to cook and scrub if we let you come. We appreciate it. Got a nice little place here. Spent several days hiking just trying to find it. The plot follows a professor of anthropology who, after reading some reports about killings deep in the woods, sets out with some students to try and track down Bigfoot. But the trip isn't made easy. There's deformed children, a weird hermit, and a cull after him. Oh yeah, and there's also Bigfoot knocking about too. This film is very up and down. There are some really fun scenes and some very entertaining moments in this, but these are all padded with very dull and boring bits that just kill any pace this film could have had. Maybe he's, maybe he's still out there. I know he's dead. 
The acting isn't really worth mentioning here. Everyone's just sort of sleeping through it and they're really not trying at all. Maybe except for the dude who plays Wanda's father. I wanted to see more of him, he was funny. Now the Bigfoot, the star of the show, you know. The Bigfoot is pretty good. When you can see him, which is hardly ever, you can barely make out what he looks like. Just like the real Bigfoot. But when you do get a good look at him, it's a lot of fun. It's a well-made costume and it's the right amount of campy silliness. Then there's things like the camera work, the cinematography and the sets. Now these are all really hard to comment on. Mainly just because the print is so bad. But more on that later. Yes, it's fantastic. So come be my guide. Are you serious? Of course. Oh, if you do that, I'll jump you. So of course, this is a cut down version of the film. From what I can gather, it's quite hard to get an uncut version. The bits that we're missing include a castration scene and an intestine removal scene. But don't worry, because we get an overly long Bigfoot rape scene. Because for some reason that's fine to leave in, but all those crappy effects, gotta remove them. The Bigfoot kills that we can kinda see involve him ragging some girls about, quietly removing a throat, and probably the best scene of the film is him picking up someone in a sleeping bag and just bashing them in. I'm saving your soul, you ungrateful bitch. I'm saving you from burning in hell. print on this one is appalling. First of all, all the way through the film there's this constant flickering bar like I've got going off at the bottom here, all the way throughout. The film's grainy and flickery, the colours all bleed together and it is far too dark. You cannot tell what the hell's going off for most of the film. This is definitely low grade film stock and then a VHS rip, but the VHS has been watched about 4,000 times before they transferred it. Awful. And on the disc, everything's back to normal. We get the incorrect logo at the beginning, the Vaults of Horrors one. We get the claw trailer, and then all the special features are what we've come to expect. Although, they've only gone and bloody spelled filmographies wrong on this disc. <sighs> that kind of reminds me of a different DVD company. My point right here. Better not. And I think it's time for the case. All the info on the back is correct, but it tells us far too much, going into nearly every plot point in the film and giving away the ending. But you know what is really terrible about this case? They spelt the director's name wrong. Twice. That's it. This is the closest to a Dead of Night release in the whole collection so far. Overall then, this is a tough film to recommend. I'd say only seek this out if you've got a soft spot for Bigfoot films like I do. If you don't, you're really not going to get much from this. Now there are a few fun scenes scattered throughout, but not nearly enough for me to give this a recommendation. Also, I believe that this is the only version of this available in the UK, unless you're willing to import... Uh, I think there is another DVD version, but it's got awful reviews as well saying that the print is just barely watchable. Probably ex exactly the same print as this, really. And I don't think there's an uncut version floating around in the UK. Which is a massive shame, really, because uh, I wouldn't mind checking out a cleaned up and uncut version of this. Fuck the BBFC though. So, a mixed one, a mixed one this week. Let's hope that changes next week. I love the title of this next film. We're gonna be checking out Zombie Creeping Flesh. <laughs> Hey, 
Time for another zombie film, I think. It's been a little while, hasn't it? Zombie Creeping Flesh, otherwise known as Hell of the Living Dead, or Virus, is a 1980 Italian zombie horror film directed by Bruno Mattai, going under the name Vincent Dawn in this one. You might recognise Bruno Mattai, because he directed the film Rats, which we covered in episode 15, and I quite enjoyed this one. And it's also written by another name you probably recognise, Claudio Fagrasa. He is probably the most famous for directing the absolutely awful Troll 2, but you might also recognise him uh, for directing Zombie Flesh Eaters 3, which we covered in episode 30. So, how does this stack up compared to all the other Italian zombie films we've seen so far? Let's have a look, shall we? Santoro, eh? look at that one. He looks like you trying to shit a brick. <laughs> Boy, with all them teeth, I sure like to have the dental concession here. <laughs> <gasps> the film starts with a zombie outbreak happening at a research facility. We then cut to a hostage situation, which has very little bearing on the plot and goes on for far too long. Then, we're with the military, and they're out in the jungle. They stumble upon two reporters in need, and they team up. They fight their way through a zombie tribe, and make their way to the research facility, where they fight even more zombies, and eventually die. Quite a typical plot for this sort of film, but it really struggles with its pacing, and it has some extremely dull moments. These are kind of made up for, though, by some very entertaining zombie fights. The acting and dubbing, as you probably guessed, are awful. Nobody really stood out as being the worst, but everybody's just written and acted terribly. On a plus side though, we get a lot of gore in this film. People getting ripped open and heads exploding. This might actually be one of the bloodiest films in the whole collection. But the quality of the effects, now that varies. It goes from sort of decent to absolutely terrible. The camera work can be quite nice. And I like the sets in this as well, I like that they shot on location. But this film has got a real problem of using far too much stock footage. Now there are two types of stock footage that it uses the most. There's shots of animals and tribal stuff. Now the latter is probably the most interesting. And we even get footage of an actual tribal death ceremony, which is really grotesque to watch. It's all over now. Yes. Don't worry, it's all over. This is another sleazy one though, and there's a lot that I'm not going to be able to show you just because of the amount of nudity that's in it. Now there's no sex in this as far as I can remember, just a hell of a lot of nudity. And one more thing that I think is worth mentioning. The soundtrack to this is done by Goblin, and I absolutely love their work. They've done some amazing soundtracks for films like Dario Argento's Suspiria and Dawn of the Dead. I think it might be the Argento cut that has the Goblin soundtrack in it. Uh, either way, they've done some incredible soundtracks, and the music's great in this film as well. But the big problem is, is that the music was taken from other films. It wasn't written specifically for this film. It's all licensed, but to me, it seems a little bit like cheating. <laughs> the 
print here is very much like the film. Very middle of the road. You know, I've seen better, but I've also seen a hell of a lot worse. There's the odd flicker, and there's the odd audio glitch here and there. But outside of that, it's fine. It's fine. And on the disc, same old stuff that we usually get. We don't get the trailer for the claw, though, at the beginning this time. And one more thing that I think is worth mentioning is that in the filmography section, we've got some typos. They spell uh, Margie Newton's name wrong and Franco Garofalo's name wrong as well. The quality's kind of dipping in these last few. And the case is pretty standard this week. The synopsis is fine, except this last bit just reads a little weird. There are some big problems on this case though. Firstly, on the front they spelt the director's fake name wrong. Then, on the back, they spelt Margie Newton's name wrong in the same way as in the filmography section, and they also spelt Franco's name wrong, but in a completely different way this time. What is this man's name? They're definitely leaning more into Dead of Night quality at this point. They must just be getting lazy as they get to the end. Overall then, this is a very middle of the road film. It suffered a lot from pacing issues, but the gore was entertaining and there's plenty of zombie action throughout. I'd say that it was better than the Flesh Eaters sequels, but nowhere near as good as something like The Zombie Dead. And I could only really recommend it to people who just need more Italian zombie films in their life. If you were looking for an upgrade, 88 Films have got you covered with a Blu-ray, but if you saw this one for cheap knocking about, you could do a hell of a lot worse. So, not the greatest, not the greatest this week. Let's hope that that changes next week, because we're going to be checking out Lamberto Barber's Demons 3 The Ogre. No relation to Shrek. It's my swamp donkey. Time for a weird one, and apparently a sequel. Demons 3, The Ogre. Let's have a look at this word salad, shall we? Originally just called The Ogre, this is a 1989 Italian made-for-TV horror film directed by Lamberto Barba and based on the original screenplay for The House by the Cemetery, directed by Lucio Fulci, and we covered this in episode 10. Lamberto Barber's name might also sound familiar to you, because he did direct a film we've already seen in the collection. He directed episode 4's A Blade in the Dark, which I wasn't a big fan of. And he also directed the original two Demons films. Uh, these were produced as well by Dario Argento, and they're really good, but they have absolutely nothing to do with this film. As a quick aside, by the way, Arrow's 4K re-releases of Demons 1 and 2 are excellent, and they're well worth grabbing even if they did balls the sound up on Demons 1. But they sent out replacement discs. But that is beside the point. Bobby, where are you? Bobby? Bobby? Where are you, Bobby? Come on, I'll show you my room. I've never been in a boy's bedroom before. There's always the first time. Uh... <laughs> the film follows a family who are on holiday in Italy. The mother slash wife of the family is a writer and she's plagued by nightmares of an ogre that attacks her. Eventually though, the dreams become a reality and they have to fight the ogre. And that's about it really. It's a very basic plot that gets pretty boring after the first half. Unfortunately, it suffers very much in the same way that A Blade in the Dark suffered, in that everything just amounts to nothing. Do you like my painting? <laughs> you like it? Do you like my painting? 
<laughs> Let's start with some good points. The acting and dubbing is pretty decent here. There's the odd funny line here and there, but it's nothing terrible. The sets are a real standout. They are fantastic. They really catch that old gothic feel. Everything's covered in dust and cobwebs. There's always something interesting in the background of shots to be looking at. Really great job on those. And the design for the ogre. It's okay. It's fine. It's a little troll too, but it's passable. And now for the major bad point. The gore is non-existent. This is barely a horror film, really. And I was massively disappointed, especially after watching Demons 1 and 2, which are just filled with gore. Now, I know this has got nothing to do with those films, technically, but still, because the name was attached, I thought it'd have a little more to do with them. Barber's got on record saying that this film suffered quite a lot from self-censorship because he was directing the film for TV. He didn't want to get the project cancelled and he thought there was a lot of stuff that he couldn't show on TV, so he ended up cutting a lot of stuff out himself. And sadly, it really shows. Come on, admit that you're letting your, your fantasy, your, your writer's fantasy, get the better of you. Huh? I won't admit shit. So, outside of the gore, the thing that really kills this film is definitely its pacing. And I'll admit, for the first half of this film I was enjoying myself, you know? It was slow, it was quite drawn out, but it felt like it was building to something. And along with the great soundtrack and the really amazing sets, it was very easy to get lost in the atmosphere. But then I started to realise that nothing was happening. And this kept going, and I started getting more impatient. All these suspenseful shots built up to absolutely nothing. And then before I knew it, I was 85 minutes in to this 90 minute film. Spoilers, I'm gonna ruin the ending now for you. I'm sure nobody cares. 85 minutes in, there's a little confrontation with the ogre. There's a chase, the family jump in a car, and they run him over. Thank you, thank you. But seriously, they do run him over, and that's it. Run him over, that's it. End of confrontation. The film ends. And that whole bit takes about one minute. Massive, massive disappointment. This is not one of your horror stories. This is reality. And reality doesn't include handprints. You bastard! The print for this one's actually pretty decent. It's clear both in the audio department and the visual department. There were a few audio pops here and there, and one really big one that made me jump. But that's about it. Pretty good, pretty good. And on the disc, same as we always get. Except we don't get the claw trailer at the beginning again. I guess that's done with now? Maybe? Who knows? Who knows? And let's have a look at this case. It's fine, really. The synopsis does read a little strange, like it's been ran through a translator or something. But it does get the point across fine. A second draft would have been nice, though. Outside of that, everything's correct. Maybe they've finally started pulling the finger out a little bit. Overall, then, this was very boring. It suffered heavily by not really having anything in it except from decent sets, and I would definitely avoid this film. But, definitely check out Demons 1 and 2. I know they've got nothing to actually do with this film, but these are very entertaining, very gory, very fun films, and the Arrow restorations in 4K are fantastic. Well worth checking out. 
There's no Blu-ray for Demons 3 in the UK, I'm not surprised. Uh, so if you wanted a copy for some weird reason, you stuck with the Vipco release. But to be fair, the print was pretty decent. So, very, very, very boring. That's the name of the game this week, boring. Let's hope that that changes next week, and I have no idea at all what this next film's about. We're going to be checking out... Death Screams. Hey, I went into this one thinking that I wasn't really going to have that much to say, but holy shit was I wrong. Death Screams, otherwise known as House of Death, or Night Scream, is a 1982 American slasher film directed by David Nilsson, who hasn't really done much else of no, outside of maybe his bit part in John Waters' film Cry Baby. So Vipko managed to take this pretty dull slasher film and turn it into something worth talking about, but not for the right reasons. Runs like a bout out of hell. Ah, that's all right. I'm a little bit partial to this meringue anyway. <laughs> so the plot for this, really boiled down, is that there's a murderer on the loose in a small suburban American town. We follow a group of teenagers and a football coach as they have fun at a fair, then go and have a party by the lake. Slowly, they get picked off, one by one, by the killer. There are a lot of side characters that just seem to have very little purpose to the main plot, such as the elderly women, they've got a lot of character, but they're completely pointless, and the disabled kid, no use in him at all, and the aggressive sheriff, complete waste of time. It's a very bare-bones plot, with what I'm sure the filmmaker will say, are a bunch of MacGuffins just sort of shoved onto the side. Now, there's a part of me though in the back of my mind that's thinking that these elements might actually work, but there's a much greater issue at play here as to why maybe they didn't sit so well with me. making an ass of yourself. Well, I've got enough to spare! <laughs> okay, I can't keep beating around the bush on this. I need to address the main issue with this film. Vipco, this release of this film, Vipco's release of this film, has scenes that play out of order. Now, I'm not talking a minute or two here and there, I'm talking large chunks of this film are played in the complete wrong order. And no, it's not a stylistic choice. No, this isn't a memento style film. Vipco got the reels in the complete wrong order and thought, yeah, that's fine. Let me run through what happened and what I was thinking. And we'll, I'll try and explain it as best I can. So the film starts with what you'd expect, a pre-credits death sequence get your credits, you meet your characters, there's like fairground frolicking for about 20 minutes, they talk about meeting up at the lake, then hard cut, we're at the lake, already. Now I just thought at this point, okay, so it's sort of speeding along a little bit, maybe there's going to be a plenty of gore and effects and fun bits at the end. And then people start dying, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it's really ramping up. Then the next thing you know, we're hard cutting to the disabled boy and his mother discussing stuff, and it's acting as though he could be the killer. But I'm there thinking, but people are already getting killed down by the lake. This guy's not the killer because he's at home in his bedroom and people are already dying. Main characters are dying off. Then it gets really weird. We cut to the kids and they're sort of meeting up and hanging out. Now, at first, like, I, 
I was questioning whether this wasn't in the right order at this point, but I wasn't, I didn't believe it. I couldn't believe that that was what was happening. And I was thinking, I've just seen these people's friends die and now they're all acting like nothing's happened. What happened to these people who were dying? Are these characters really that awful that they don't give a shit that the mate's just being killed? And then it really hit home when one of the kids, one of the main kids who'd been killed was alive well and swinging on a rope swinging to the lake. Now we're back at the lake, pre-killings, hard cut back, now everyone's already half dead and it's the end of the film. It completely kills any potential pacing that this film could have had. Any MacGuffin that it was setting up, completely dead because you kind of see who the killer is in a way and then it's like, ooh, is it this person? Like, no, of course it's not that person. Now, I've seen a lot of films. I have a lot of DVDs here. Not one of these films shows the film in the completely incorrect order. This, <clears throat> losing my voice, I'm that riled up about it. This is the only example of a film that I have that plays in the complete wrong order, that gets the reels completely mixed up. Even The Dead of Night managed to show its shitty, shitty films in order. Absolutely appalling. Awful. Bad film. Bad. Bad Vipka. Yeah, the cemetery. Yeah, you know. Make love on the tombstone. <laughs> Feel the coolness of the rocks against your better skin. <laughs> Outside of all that, though, the acting is not really noteworthy at all, apart from maybe a few of the supporting characters who've got the odd funny line here and there. Also, the main characters are just really annoying. The gore and effects are pretty much non-existent because on top of everything else, this film is heavily cut. So it's a case of something gory is about to happen and we cut away just before it happens. I also guess the killer pretty early on, so it's just kind of boring, really. But let's try and think of some positives. There's got to be some positives in this film, surely. Um, I quite liked the small town America vibes that it gives off. It kind of reminded me of like a very low budget Twin Peaks or Blue Velvet. And I've got a real soft spot for that. Really nice aesthetic. Also, the music is just insanely over the top. Very obnoxious and out of place, and it made me laugh quite a few times. And I think that's about it for positives. So how's the print then, outside of being in the wrong order of course? Well it's awful, it is absolutely terrible, it's flickery, the blacks are crushed so badly that in the dark shots you can't tell what the hell's happening, and a lot of this film is shot in the dark as well. And there's also this really weird thing, sort of like this sort of much at the top of the screen, it like, it feels like the film curves slightly and it gets sort of darker, it's almost like a dark gradient going at the top. Now I'm not sure if you're going to be able to make that out in the footage that I'll be showing you, but check it out see if you can see it. It was really distracting while I was watching the film. Oh yeah, and it's in the wrong order. There's that as well. And on the disc, same old stuff. Same old stuff as usual. They get the claw trailer, that one's back, and for once everything on the menus are spelled right. So that's good. And time for the case. It's fine, it reads badly, but it's right in what it's saying, and all the info is correct. Overall then, maybe this film has more going for it than this DVD presents. But judging by what I've seen, just basing it solely off of what I watched, I cannot recommend the film or the release. But I, I feel so bad for this film though, it, it really got shafted. It's mixed up, it's heavily cut, and it has a shite print, just killing any enjoyment you can get out of this. Now, at the time of recording this, Arrow, 
I've got a Blu-ray up for pre-order and it will be out by the time this review's out. And you know what? I'll give it another go. I, I feel so bad for it that I will happily give it another go with a proper Blu-ray release. I trust Arrow. They do some really good releases. I'm sure it'll be a nice print. I'm sure it'll be in the right order as well. And you never know, maybe there is a subpar mediocre slasher film hidden within this piece of shit. If you're interested in watching this film, don't get the Vipco release. Why would you get the Vipco release? Get the Arrow one when that's out. Well, one of the, no, sod that, the worst, the worst Vipco release we've seen so far this week. You can tell we're close to the end, can't you? We have three films left. Three films left. And you can really tell that they just don't give a shit anymore, can you? Let's hope they at least put a bit of effort in on this next one. I really hope they did. I've never heard of it before. We're going to be checking out... God told me to. no idea what to expect going into this one. I just really hope that Vipco hadn't ballsed up quite as much as they did last week. Let's see if they did, shall we? God told me to, also known as Demon, no relation to Demons 3 the Ogre, is a 1976 American sci-fi horror cop film written and directed by Larry Cohen, who is probably most well known for writing the Maniac Cop trilogy, and he also wrote and directed a film called The Stuff. Get ready, this is a weird one. God told me to. No! What's the matter with you? I don't feel very well. We follow a detective called Peter. There's been a bunch of random killing sprees taking place in New York, and they're all connected by the people saying that God told them to do it. The rabbit hole leads Peter into the realms of virgin births, alien abductions, and second comings, but he might be linked closer to the whole thing than he initially thought. This is a really great plot. I absolutely loved this one. There's a lot of twists and turns, and it really kept me guessing throughout, and it kind of felt like an X-Files episode, which is not a bad thing at all. It can be a little slow in points. It is from the 70s, so it's got that slower pace, but there's enough weirdness to keep it interesting. Hair down to his shoulders. Like a girl, one of those hippie types. You have always to watch them, or they rip you off. I don't have many friends with long hair. Well, my boy, he didn't hang around those types. That's why. The acting here is actually pretty decent, which is a massive surprise for a bloody Vipco film. But there were no characters that really stood out as being particularly terrible, and the cast seemed pretty well versed. It does dip into the melodramatic every now and then, but I quite like that. Makes me laugh. Uh, the gore and effects are fine. They're pretty by the books, but it works for this sort of film because the focus is more on the plot than the gore. And we do get some funny death scenes every now and then as well, just to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, the camera work is pretty basic, but every now and then it does really shine through and impress us. Uh, especially with the lighting and shadows around some of the most supernatural characters, works really well. What do you have to hurt me now? Don't you see? What happened to you is over after I was born. What's happening to me is just beginning. You get out of here. Don't touch me. <laughs> So 
So now I'm just going to mention a few things that I found interesting and that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first one uh, involves spoilers, so if you don't want the film ruined, just skip ahead like 20 seconds or something, I'm not going to talk much on this. Uh, but the film comes to a climax and it's this big showdown in front of this Jesus style character and he lifts his robe out to reveal that he has a prosthetic vagina on his side and then he gets killed. Now I don't really have much more to say on that other than it happened and it made me laugh. Secondly I want to like really emphasize just how all over the place this film is because it's so slow it kind of just washes over you and you don't realize how mental what you're watching actually is. But there's like possessions, alien abductions, all the weird religious stuff. It packs a lot in. And I've not seen a film that's managed to put so much craziness into one thing in ages. Really was a treat to watch. And thirdly, it's worth mentioning that this is the first film to feature the comedian Andy Kaufman. Which is crazy, he plays a uh, possessed policeman. And I'm a big fan of Andy Kaufman, so it was really cool to see him pop up in this. And now it's time to look at the print, and it's not great. Now it's not as bad as last week's, there are no massive errors like last week's, but it's still not great. It's very low resolution, so it's difficult to make out any of the smaller details. And also the film is just filthy, there's flickers and grain all over the place. And the audio is no good too, there's a hiss throughout most of it, and it's very compressed. No good. And on the disc? Same old, I'm sure you weren't expecting anything else really, were you? And we even get an error again. Filmographies, they just can't spell it right recently. And you can just tell that they don't really give a crap anymore. And the case is fine for this one. Sums it up pretty well without giving away too much. And it seems to be spelling error free. Not much to say really. Overall then, this was a lot of fun. If you like a crazy film with a bit of a slower pace and less focus on gore and more on the plot, then you might get something from this. Also, it definitely had maniac cop vibes because of the uh, police procedural aspect of it. Also, if you're a fan of the X-Files, definitely, definitely check this out because the plot would be right at home, like season four of the X-Files. Now unfortunately, there is no Blu-ray or re-release of this film in the UK. So you're stuck with this Vipco DVD, and it isn't great. Now it is watchable, it's just not great. So if you see it for cheap, it might be worth grabbing, but this is in desperate need of a re-release. So, decent film this week. Thank God for that, eh? We needed a decent one, it's been a little while. And we're very close to the end. We've only got two films left. Just two films left. And I have been dying to check out this next one, based solely on the title. We're gonna be checking out Snow Beast. So, we're getting close to the end now. How will Vipco treat the two last films? Well, judging by the penultimate film, not very well. Snow Beast is a 1977 made-for-TV Yeti horror film directed by Herb Wallerstein, who is mainly known for doing episodes of TV shows. And the film stars Bo Svensson, who you might recognise from Kill Bill and Inglorious Bastards. And it also stars Sylvia Sidney, who's been in Beetlejuice, and for those who watch this review show, you might recognise her as playing the melodramatic old woman in last week's film, God Told Me To. Weird, huh? 
do you like skiing? Because this film sure does. A better alternate title would have been Skiing and Nothingness. The plot is about a ski lodge that's under attack by a yeti, so the ski lodge owner, a cop, an ex-athletic skier, and a journalist set out to kill the yeti. And that's it. This film is extremely boring. Nothing really happens, there's barely any action, just a hell of a lot of talking, and a hell of a lot of skiing. Did you ever play that old PC game, Ski Free? That's got more plot to it than this film does. Heidi only saw the footprints. I saw the thing itself. The acting is fine for the most part. There's nothing hilarious or memorable here although it can dip into the melodramatic every now and then, and some of the bit part characters can be a little odd. There's pretty much no gore to speak of in this. You get a little bit of fake blood in the snow, and that's your lot, really. And the Yeti, well, the costume looks like it could be something interesting, something quite cool, but you barely get a good look at it. Most of the shots of the Yeti are either it in the distance, so you can barely see it, it's behind some trees, really up close for a split second and it's gone, or first person perspective from the Yeti's view. Just really disappointing. And then, on the filmmaking side of things, it's very by the books, inoffensive, and flat. Although, the location that they chose to shoot on is quite nice, but it was probably just an excuse for a skiing holiday. Now this is very obviously a made for TV movie. Outside of the tamer nature of the film, there's also these very obvious scene end transitions. Uh, every 15 minutes in the film, thereabouts, the film will freeze frame, become tinted red, and then fade to black. Now, these are very clearly advert breaks. I haven't seen a film, unless I was watching it on TV I guess, that has such blatant advert breaks in it before. Also, weirdly, this film was remade in 2011. Now, I have two theories about this. Either somebody loved the film so much, they just had to remake it. Or the second theory ties in quite well with what I've seen in the trailer. Because it looks to me like they're using the exact same Yeti costume. So my second theory is, is that somebody won the Yeti costume in an auction, and went, well, now I've got this Yeti costume, might as well do something with it, and hence the remake appeared. And it looks about as good as you're probably imagining, although it does seem like they use the Yeti a hell of a lot more. He's in the trailer way more than he was in the entirety of the original. print for this one isn't too bad this time really. It's got the odd flicker and it can be a little low resolution, but it's quite watchable really. And on the disc, 
Same old stuff that we always get. But this one has got spelling error free menus, so that's pretty good. The case for this one seems fine really, it sums up everything nicely. I think it needed a comma here, but that's about it. Overall then, this was a very boring watch, and I can honestly say that there is nothing at all worth seeing in this film. It tries to justify itself by adding little side stories for the characters, but it's so hard to care when you're only here to see a bloody yeti. Now I have seen this film compared, not favourably mind, but I have seen it compared to Jaws, and while I'm not a massive fan of that film either, it is miles better than this piece of crap. Of course, there's no Blu-ray re-release of this, so if for some reason you really wanted to own a copy or watch this film, this print's fine. So, very disappointing film this week, and next week we're going to be watching the last film in the entire collection. I cannot believe we're at this point already. Will we end on a high note, or will we just sort of peter out with another boring, crappy film. We're going to be watching... Bloody hell. It's only bloody, bloody moon. I liked doing that bit, that was fun. Bloody moon. Here we are then, the last film in the entire collection. Will it be good, or will it be terrible? Well, I mean, how bad can it be? It is directed by Jesus, after all. Let's have a look, shall we? Bloody Moon is a 1981 Spanish-German slasher film directed by Jesus Franco, who has done a ton of exploitation films. And looking into his filmography, I realise that I've not actually seen much by the guy. I've definitely seen his most famous one though, Venus in Furs, which I watched back in 2013 I think, late one night on the Horror Channel. I remember quite enjoying it. So let's have a look at this 79 minute long finale, shall we? Miguel, I'm your sister. Don't look at me that way. Go back to the dance. <laughs> For such a short film, the plot really does get convoluted here. So we start with a man with a disfigured face who kills a woman in a cabin that's in some sort of villa uh, campsite area, which he is like the heir to, and he gets sent to a mental hospital. Years later, he's released by his sister, who he's having an incestuous affair with. At the camp, at this time, there is some sort of language lesson retreat for women, or for mostly women, really weirdly specific, and girls keep getting picked off one by one by a masked killer. Is it the same dude as before, or is it somebody different? And will the inheritance subplot ever get resolved? It really packs a lot in this film, but unfortunately the pacing is terrible. By about the half an hour mark I realised I was getting really bored. It kind of crams all the plot into the first 20-25 minutes, then it spends about 40-50 to 50 minutes just sort of milling about, not really doing anything, and then picks up in the last 5 minutes. Oh. Oh. What are you doing? Turn that light off, it's blinding me! Turn it off, do you hear? It's gone there. I'm going to kill you. You're as good as dead. The acting and dubbing are terrible in a really fun way, and I found myself laughing quite a lot, especially at how weirdly hurried along some of the lines are. And the gore, for the most part, is missing. Unfortunately, a lot of the scenes that put this in the video nasty list in the 80s have been removed, but we do get a little bit of gore here and there. 
The editing is really weird. It's got some of the hardest cuts I have ever seen in a film, and it nearly cuts people off mid-word. The cinematography is pretty nice here, and there is a nice use of colour, but for the most part this film is far too dark for its own good. Angela, I have to speak to you. <laughs> choose you when all you do is throw him in the swimming pool and make a nuisance of yourself. <laughs> oh, Antonio would understand. It's only a little fun. Besides, that's the best way to learn a foreign language. In bed. Well, when all you want to is become Antonio's Spanish-speaking mistress. <laughs> Paco, have you seen Manuela and Miguel? There's not really much more to say about this film outside of it's just kind of a generic slasher with a few twists and turns in the plot and some like weird subject matter, such as the incest stuff. Oh yeah, this film is also really sleazy. A lot of nudity and sex in this. And I can't actually show you a lot of the kills, because most of the time, the girls are topless for them. And there's also this really weird through line, where all the girls are raving about banging this one dude. I mean, you could show the sex and the nudity, but someone getting their head cut off by a buzzsaw. Oh no, can't show that. The for this one is once again terrible. Start as you mean to go on, I guess, and they really did. This is clearly a VHS rip. There's massive flickers, there's these big white dots that appear sometimes, and the resolution is so low that you can barely tell what's happening sometimes. And what doesn't help matters, as I mentioned earlier, is this is quite a dark film. Shame, really. And on the disc, same old stuff that we always get. But let's run through it all together, shall we? For old time's sake. So we get the Vaults of Horror logo at the beginning, incorrectly put there, as per usual. Then we move on to the Claw trailer, which stuck around way longer than I was expecting it to. Then we get Chapter Select, we get a Stills Gallery, we get Filmographies, spelt incorrectly as Filmographies again, and four repeated trailers. You all know what they are, but let's go through them. Cannibal Holocaust, Shogun Assassin, Mountain of the Cannibal God, and Psychic Killer. And there we have it. The case for this one is crazy. There's so much text here. All the info is correct, I guess, but it just reads terribly. Here's an example. And this bit made me laugh too. The screenshots are tiny as well, just not a great look all in all. Overall then, this was unfortunately a bit of a boring one. There are a few interesting kills here, and the plot is crazy as hell, and it might interest some people who are looking to really scrape the bottom of that slasher barrel. But don't get this copy, there is a Blu-ray knocking about that's fully uncut by a company called Severin, who I've never heard of before, and that's an odd word isn't it? And I was thinking, where have I heard that word before? I remembered of course, Lou Reed says it quite a lot in the Velvet Underground song Venus in Furs, which is weird because obviously Jesus Franco directed Venus in Furs. What a coincidence, or maybe it was intentional, but that's beside the point. Definitely grab a copy of the Blu-ray if you're interested in this and avoid this release altogether. It's not worth your time. So there we have it. Every film in the collection, watched and reviewed. So join me next week for the final episode where I'll give my final thoughts and try and unpick this massive project. Hey up. Hope you enjoyed my reviews for the Vipco Screen Time Collection. I definitely enjoyed making them. It was a lot more time consuming than I imagined, but it was nice to finally sit down and watch some of these films, because a lot of them I hadn't actually seen going into this. And also, I feel like I've not wasted my money now, which is good. So this is going to be a bit of a looser episode. It's not very tightly scripted or anything like that, 
So I might ramble on a little bit about various things. But yeah, we're just going to be talking about final thoughts and just a few bits and bobs about Vipco as a company and the releases themselves. Uh, so to start off with, I'd say, compared to the last review show that I did on the Dead of Night collection, which is in that back corner over there where it belongs, in the back corner, I'd say that Vipco was more consistent with its quality. Now, it's by no means good quality, but the films are more consistently watchable, I'd say. But saying that, with the nostalgic popularity and infamy of Vipco, I was expecting a little bit better, and overall a little bit disappointed with the company as a whole, with the releases that we got. And I'm wondering if it is a case that Vipco was just the best of a bad situation for companies releasing this sort of film around the 80s to the 2000s, because it sure does feel that way. So to make this video a little bit easier, I'm splitting it up into sections. Uh, so let's get cracking with the first section. So for the films, we really were all over the place with this uh, release company. We had some of the best giallo Italian horrors I've ever seen. And we also had some of the worst bottom of the barrel slashers, piles of crap that I've ever seen. So, as you can see here, I have arranged them in order of best to worst. Don't worry, there'll be some nice shots coming up so you can check out the actual order of things. But let's just talk now about the best, the number one best, and the number 45 bottom worst film. Let's start with the best, shall we? For those who've seen the reviews, you can probably guess what I'm going to say for this one. Of course, The Zombie Dead. I did mention this a hell of a lot. I kept bringing it up, saying that other films just weren't quite as good as this one. Still got the weird hair coming off it. No idea what that's about. Can you see that, right? Really odd. Um, the Zombie Dead just made me laugh quite consistently. I was engaged. It had some really good effects. It was weird as hell. And I have watched this at a party with friends, and it really heightens the experience. This is a must-watch for fans of bizarre zombie films. That boy in it, it just, it makes me laugh every time I think about it. It is a fantastic film. And and the print was pretty good and all that sort of stuff. We'll talk about that more later. We're talking, we're trying to judge it based just on the films here. We're not trying to go too far into the um, the quality of the print and stuff like that. Just based on films alone, this one was fantastic. And what was your worst? Well, you probably know what the worst was as well if you've uh, watched this series through. Of course it was Drive-In Massacre. What a piece of shit film this was. Only 70 minutes long, but they managed to just make that 70 minutes the most unenjoyable 70 minutes I've had watching a film for the past few years, honestly. It was boring, nothing really happened. It was just a lot of talking and a massive waste of time. Avoid this film at all cost. There are much better films, and it even had a crappy gimmick tacked on at the end. So, that was the best and the worst. So now let's have a little look a bit deeper to see what my top five and bottom five were. My top five, I think, are hands down the best films Vipco bothered with on this label, which are The Zombie Dead, The Beyond, City of the Living Dead, Stage Fright, and Case of the Bloody Iris, in that order. All Italian horrors, with two being from Falshi as well, which I think definitely speaks to my tastes quite a bit. These are for sure films that I'll be re-watching in the future. And the bottom five, probably the most anticipated bit, they are The Slayer, The Deadly Spawn, Death Screams, The Dungeon, and Drive-In Massacre all in that order. A lot of these were mainly just very boring. It was more that there wasn't enough stuff happening in it, and I think that's basically the crux of why they're in the bottom. Things like Deadly Spawn and Dungeon, obviously, they were also butchered by the print. Uh, as I said earlier, I am trying to separate the film and the print as best as I can, but for something like Death Screams, 
it's very difficult to do. Outside of obviously choosing the films that they release, it was also Vipco's job to do the print to remaster these films to make them worth rebuying again on DVD as opposed to VHS. And I mean, it even says on the cases, look, digitally remastered. And there were some really good examples of that. There were some fantastic prints here. Ghost House, Stage Fright, they looked amazing. They were clean and clear, and I'd say probably an upgrade from the VHS releases. But then you have those other releases that they put out where they clearly just couldn't be bothered. A lot of VHS rips, unfortunately. Really low quality, low resolution. And it kind of made some of these films unwatchable, such as Grave of the Vampire or The Dungeon, which just looked ridiculous. Then, of course, you have things like Death Screams, which they definitely did the dirty on. And I really struggled to review that film compared to all the other films because there was a massive scene completely in the wrong order. So you're watching the film completely out of order, and I don't, don't know how they missed that in the restoration process. Restoration process, as they say. And then, of course, the other majorly butchered film was The House at the Edge of the Park, which was more butchered on the, because of the BBFC. But I was thinking about this, and around the time that these DVDs specifically were coming out, which is around 2003, now around that time, I'm guessing that if Vipco had have appealed some of these cuts, they probably could have got them either reduced or completely retracted altogether. But it seems to me, especially with the prints, that all they did was they took a pre-cut VHS version of the film, did a little bit of cleanup, whacked it on a DVD to make a bit of quick cash. Or so it seems anyway with some of these, and if that is the case, it's a big shame really, it is a big shame. Because some of them it does feel like they did try. As for the cases and the menus and such, they definitely did a much better job than the Dead of Night collection. Hands down, there were fewer spelling errors and the menus were a bit more consistent. But also then, you can see that they were starting to get lazy towards the end. A lot of spelling errors in the menus, filmographies, they just really struggled to get that one right. And worst back of the case award definitely goes to Island of Death. That was just a weird garbled mess that went on for far too long. I have to say that overall, special features were very disappointing for this collection. You've got like just a bunch of repeated stuff for most of it, and two out of the four repeated trailers aren't even released under the Scream Time label. It's weird because towards the beginning, we had two releases that actually had things that were worthy of being called special features on them. On Island of Death, you had an interview with the director, and on City of the Living Dead, you had an interview with the lead actress. And then they just kind of gave up. And let us not forget the fabled, the bizarre, the anomaly that was the trailer for Tim. What the hell was that all about? You can say, I guess, definitively now, but the Screen Time Collection advertises six different films. Five of those are horror films, and the other one is Tim, some bloody sappy daytime romance film with Catherine from Twin Peaks in it. And Mel Gibson, wasn't it? Was it Mel Gibson? Something like that. I'm gonna have to check that film out at some point. I haven't seen it yet. I'll find a copy somewhere. And as soon as we're talking about trailers, as if, for unrelated films as well, as if they're classed as special features. Let us not forget the trailer for The Claw. Now that was a really odd one, because it kept coming and going for a bit, and then it just stuck around until the end. Now, it's a really odd film for them to advertise, I feel anyway, because it's not a film that they released, and if you try looking it up these days, it had a name change at some point, and it's now rebranded as a Christmas film. That's another one to add to the pile that I'm going to have to check out at some point. If we're comparing, and, I, and we are comparing, 
I would say that the Dead of Night collection did special features better. I know. Dead of Night did something better than Vipka. But, if memory serves, the Dead of Night actually had relevant trailers to the film that you were watching, and even had like extra features, there were interviews, and there were soundtracks. A lot of the films had the soundtrack included, which is like way, way better than just some filmography spelled slightly wrong. But then, I guess you can argue, the Scream Time collection is Vipco's budget release. You're probably wondering, what future for Vipco? Vipco's been bust for years. Nope, Vipco is back. And it's producing films now, and it's doing a film competition as well. Don't know if it's a scam or not, so this isn't an advertisement for that. But if you're interested in Vipco, it might be worth keeping an eye on. And they've also already got a film out as well, which I can't really remember the name of. So just give me one second. The film is called Devil in the Woods, very generic name. And it looks god awful. It looks shit. Getting terrible reviews. So of course I'm going to have to check that one out at some point. Let's see what Vipco are up to these days, shall we? Remember that website that I mentioned as well in the first episode, I think it was? Well, don't go on that website anymore. It's gone. It's because Vipco has been rebranded because they're doing more stuff with the Vipco label. It's got a new website, so the old website's been taken down. It's a shame. I got a lot of my information from that website. That's how I figured out exactly what films were in the collection and bits and bobs like that, what number, what catalogue number they were and all that sort of stuff. And this whole thing has just made it that little bit harder to research Vipco, unfortunately. One last thing to end on with this section, I would say, is that Spookies has got a re-release on Special Edition Blu-ray, thanks to 101 Films. And included in this Special Edition Blu-ray is the Vipco documentary that I mentioned. I think I mentioned that in episode one as well, which again, still haven't seen. I haven't been doing my extracurricular activity ever. But I do really want to check it out and I'll probably grab it at some point. I was looking in an whether to buy the Blu-ray, but honestly, I just don't want another copy of Spookies in my house. After all this talk of Vipco, you might be wondering, is it worth collecting Vipco now? And I would have to say no. <laughs> no. But don't dismiss Vipco either. Now, if you're like me, then you'll have a deep set nostalgia for this sort of film. And if that is the case, like a low, cheap, dirty, print, crappy, you don't know what you're going to get version, then you might get something from collecting these. But I'm sure a lot of you might think you like that, and then you'll start, and then the big problem will arise and you'll realize that you're making a bit of a mistake and that big problem is how many re-releases there are these days back when I was a kid till about five years ago Vipco was the perfect option for me I was skint and I needed to see some weird ass horror and you'd pop down to CEX or the local market and you pick up a Vipco film and it'd scratch that itch. But these days, you've got companies, these huge Blu-ray companies like 88 Films, Arrow, 101 Films, Shameless, Second Sight, even Bloody Criterion have released some weird shit. And you look at these versions of these films, they're picking out old B-movies that you didn't even remember watching when you were a kid. And they're giving them special editions with special features, soundtracks, posters, amazing artwork, and so much care and attention. And it's like, why would you not get that, you know? I mean, it's easier as well these days to find an Arrow Blu-ray than it is to find a Vipco DVD, it seems. Now, obviously, there are some films that Vipco have put out that haven't been re-released. And if you really need to see these films, then 
what harm can buying the only version available do to you, unless you're willing to import, but I've not really dabbled in that area yet, so I'm not versed enough. For me, I've not been importing, so it's either Vipco or Bust on a lot of these films. But if that's not the case, then I would strongly suggest giving your money to a company who cares. And some of these 2K, 4K restorations, you might think, yeah, but a grainy, old, dirty film. I, that's what I want, that's the aesthetic kind I want. And sometimes that can work, but rarely, rarely can that work. Watching a nice 2K restoration of a B movie, it can really give you that appreciation for it that you didn't even know you had. And there we have it. I think we've now officially talked Vipco to death and I need a break. But there is another DVD release that I'm yet to talk about that interests me. And for those observant viewers out there, you may have noticed it popping up in the background of these reviews. But that's for another time. Thanks for watching.